Hello, and welcome everyone, and thank you all for joining us for the ninth Annual National Voices of Medicare Summit and Senator Jay Rockefeller Lecture. We appreciate you all joining us today to be a part of this fantastic program and support the work of the Center for Medicare Advocacy. I'm Matt Shepard, the Communications Director for the Center for Medicare Advocacy, and I'm here to welcome you, and you may hear from me, time permitting, with questions for our speakers. Speaking of whom, I'd like to thank all of the fantastic, generous folks who've taken the time to be here with us as panelists today, as well as our 2022 Senator Jay Rockefeller Lecturer, E.J. Dion. In addition, none of this would be possible without our fantastic sponsoring organizations, our inclusivity sponsor, Arnold Ventures, the Senator Jay Rockefeller Lecture Sponsor, the John A. Hartford Foundation, panel sponsors AARP, the Alzheimer's Association, the Santa Fe Group, and SEIU, community sponsors, the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, and Powers, Pyle, Sutter, and Verbal, PC, program sponsors, the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care, the Medicare Rights Center, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and the Rothkopf Law Group, and Friends of the Summit, Families USA, the Gerontological Society of America, Justice and Aging, Sturgill and Long, SC, the Lynch Group of Oppenheimer and Company, <clears throat> and Mansfield Family Practice. Thank you all for your generous support of the National Voices of Medicare Summit and Senator Jay Rockefeller Lecture. Uh, today's going to run a little differently than our prior virtual presentations in that it will look more like a live TV broadcast, as you can see. Uh, speakers going to be pulled up, cut to, cut away from, and so on. The player on the page that I hope you're all watching me on will show all of today's live video feeds, and it contains a pane to enter questions and comments. Uh, you can make that player full screen at any time. There's a little sort of square down at the bottom right corner. But please be aware that if you do make it full screen, it's going to cover up your questions pane, and it will definitely cover up the live captioning that accompanies today's presentation. So if you wish to use that captioning, you will need to keep the presentation in that viewer mode rather than putting it in full screen. And now, with some of those technical details out of the way, let us get started in earnest. It's my pleasure to welcome Center for Medicare Advocacy Board President Judy Fader and Center for Medicare Advocacy Executive Director Judith Stein to begin us framing the day. Thank you, Matt. What a <clears throat> pleasure it is and a privilege, as always, to welcome you all to this summit. It's not as good virtually as in person, though we are pleased to have such wide participation from all over the country. We are a great community, as today's conversations will make abundantly clear, committed to assuring, assuring and strengthening the right to health care that Medicare provides. Given what we hear about the Supreme Court, I'm sure that on all our minds is how easy it seems to be to take away a right. Horrifying, but at this moment, way too easy. I'm proud to chair the CMA board, helping this amazing organization make sure that does not happen here through education, advocacy, and litigation, Judy Stein and her extraordinary band of colleagues use their deep and extensive knowledge of Medicare to remind us all how the Medicare program is supposed to work, how it can work, and how it must work to live up to its promise. And now, to speak for herself, which she does very well, it is my <laughs> honor to pass the mic to Judy Stein. Thank you, my dear board chair and friend. Uh, we are so blessed to have Judy Fader as the president of our board and a fellow colleague in making things work as well as possible for people who need help. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I believe we have over 625 folks from all over the country, all 50 states, Puerto Rico, and I think many of the territories. That would not be possible if it wasn't for the incredible summit team, in particular, Jeff Wiseman, our development manager, Scott Perkins, our operations director, Matt Shepard, the communications director, and David Lipschitz, our senior policy attorney. It's a, a mighty crew, very small, but we've done extraordinary work to bring this program to you today. 
I thank you all. I thank the presenters. I particularly want to thank Julia Kubansky for um, presenting today, uh, in not um, instead of, <laughs> but as the partner of Trish. Patricia, who cannot be with us because of the family emergency. And I really appreciate, Julie, at, that you're um, able to join us today and also all the wonderful work you do. When we envisioned this program nine years ago, we hoped to create a time for a multidisciplinary group of people who care about fair access to Medicare, quality health care, and equity to get together to exchange ideas, learn, energize one another, and have some fun. Of course, our vision included chatting and lunching together. Once again, that has changed because of the pandemic, but what has not changed is our commitment to making Medicare work for all the people who rely on it, to open doors to quality health care for all the people who rely on Medicare, now over 64 million people and to building community to help do this. By using all of our many skills and experiences, we punch above our weight. Sometimes we're called a small but mighty group, and we add to this group with our relationships across many disciplines to speak out for people who are otherwise left behind without a responsive healthcare system, to insist that Medicare treat all beneficiaries well, and to remember Medicare's purpose, to serve all, all, all older people and people with disabilities, not investors. To give, together, we give voice to the people and families who too often are told, no, no, that rehab is not covered. No, home care cannot continue. No. You can't get that medicine. As John, Representative John Lewis implored us when he spoke at our 2019 summit, together we can make a way where there is no way to open doors to quality, equitable health care for all who rely on Medicare, all 64 million and their families who rely on Medicare and on us to help Medicare work the way it's intended. Let's get started. And to do so, I really am so grateful to introduce and thank Juliette Kabansky for joining us from the Kaiser Family Foundation to frame the day, give us a kind of status report of where Medicare is now. Juliette is the Deputy Director of the Program on Medicare at Kaiser Family Foundation where she conducts research and analysis on Medicare policy issues and has been doing so since 2004. She earned her PhD in health policy at Harvard University, a master's of public policy and a master's of public health from the University of California, Berkeley, and a bachelor of arts degree from the University of California at Los Angeles. I suspect Juliet got up earlier than intended this morning to join us from the West Coast to help frame the day for this wonderful gathering of advocates and people who are insistent, are insistent on making a way where there is no way. Juliet, thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, on behalf of my esteemed colleague, Tricia Newman, let me take this opportunity to thank you, uh, Judy Stein and Judy Fader, for the invitation to kick off this year's National Voices of Medicare Summit and, and set the course uh, for today's important discussions about Medicare. As Judy said, I am Juliette Kubansky and I'm Deputy Director of the Program on Medicare Policy at KFF, filling in for Tricia, who sends her regrets uh, for being able, unable to join you today. Over the next 15 minutes or so, I want to talk to you about the challenges and opportunities facing the Medicare program today. Next slide, please. Let's start, as things should, with a focus on the people that Medicare covers. While many Medicare beneficiaries enjoy good health, 
not all do. About one in three have some form of functional impairment. About one in four report being in fair or poor health. And about one in five have a cognitive or mental impairment. And while most Medicare beneficiaries are ages 65 and older, it's important to note that about 8 million beneficiaries qualify for Medicare because they are under age 65 and live with long-term disabilities. Next slide, please. Another important thing to know about Medicare beneficiaries is that most live on relatively low incomes. There are a lot of numbers on this slide, but first let me draw your attention to the circled numbers above the gray bars. These are the median values for income, savings, and home equity for Medicare beneficiaries overall. So in other words, half of all Medicare beneficiaries had income of about $30,000 or less in 2019. Half had savings of about $74,000 or less, and half had home equity of about $75,000 or less. It's really important to point out that these median values mask real disparities in income, savings, and home equity, with Black and Hispanic beneficiaries having significantly lower resources than white beneficiaries. And this has serious implications for the affordability of healthcare costs for these different groups. Next slide, please. So let's, let's talk about affordability. Next slide. While Medicare covers important medical benefits, it doesn't come without a cost to beneficiaries. Not only are there cost-sharing requirements for Medicare-covered services, but there's no out-of-pocket cap for the amount that beneficiaries pay for covered services or for prescription drugs, and benefits that older adults might really need, like dental, vision, hearing, and long-term services and supports, are not covered by Medicare. There is some financial assistance available to low-income beneficiaries, but even modest assets are enough to disqualify someone from eligibility for this help. Next slide, please. Consequently, out-of-pocket costs run into the thousands of dollars, both for covered and uncovered services, and for premiums for Medicare and supplemental coverage, which many beneficiaries have in order to help pay their Medicare cost-sharing requirements. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Buying supplemental coverage generally requires paying costly premiums, but does help alleviate the burden of coinsurance and co-pays for Medicare-covered services. And yet some beneficiaries still face thousands of dollars in out-of-pocket costs, most notably those in poor health, with multiple chronic conditions, and those ages 85 and older for whom the cost of long-term services and supports is especially burdensome. Next slide, please. So I wanna switch gears now and dive into the role of private plans in Medicare today. Next slide. In recent years, the share of Medicare beneficiaries enrolled in private plans has grown steadily to the point where we'll soon have half of all Medicare beneficiaries enrolled in these private plans known as Medicare Advantage. The foundation of Medicare is changing from one where traditional fee-for-service Medicare is the norm and Medicare private plans were really a sideshow to one now where Medicare looks much more like a marketplace of private plans and traditional Medicare may be the refuge for a relatively small, uh, but probably relatively sicker subset of people on Medicare. Next slide, please. If you've spent any time watching any television, any time in the last couple of years, you've no doubt seen numerous marketing pitches from insurance companies touting all the wonderful extra benefits available for free to Medicare beneficiaries if they sign up for a private Medicare Advantage plan. These ads definitely make Medicare Advantage sound very enticing, and it's not hard to see the advantages from a beneficiary standpoint when comparing traditional Medicare to Medicare Advantage. 
With Medicare Advantage, it's one-stop shopping. You don't need to buy a separate Medigap policy to help pay Medicare cost sharing, and you don't need to buy a separate plan for, pre for prescription drug coverage. Many Medicare Advantage plans are offered for no premium. Zero is definitely less than what you'd pay for a Medigap policy. Plans are quick to tout their supplemental benefits, like dental and vision and hearing, and all plans are required to have an out-of-pocket limit on Part A and Part B services. But the disadvantages are also not hard to see, although you won't hear about these from the plans themselves in any of their marketing campaigns. One of the main disadvantages is that plans have networks of providers that limit beneficiary choice when it comes to which doctors they can see. This can lead to higher out-of-pocket costs if beneficiaries go out of network for care. Prior authorization is also a common feature in the process of accessing services covered by Medicare Advantage plans. A final disadvantage worth mentioning is that the choice of Medicare Advantage can actually lock a beneficiary into Medicare Advantage coverage because of rules that limit the ability to buy a Medigap policy if you wanna switch back to traditional Medicare. Next slide, please. So sticking with the positives, most MA plans do in fact offer benefits that are not covered by traditional Medicare. Eye exams and eyeglasses, health club memberships, telehealth, hearing exams, and dental services are covered by virtually all Medicare Advantage plans. Next slide, please. But turning to the not so positives, cost related problems are not uncommon for beneficiaries in Medicare Advantage and more so for this population than those in traditional Medicare who have supplemental coverage. One in five Medicare Advantage enrollees overall reported a cost related problem in 2019 and this rises to nearly one third of black beneficiaries in Medicare Advantage. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, the need for prior authorization is something that most, if not all Medicare Advantage enrollees will encounter in accessing Medicare covered services through their plan. This is particularly true for users of durable medical equipment, Part B physician administered drugs, and facility stays, but also not uncommon for those who need diagnostic lab work and procedures. Next slide, please. And stepping back, it's, it's not just that Medicare private plans are playing a larger role in providing coverage of Medicare benefits, benefits that may be a concern. It's that enrolling in Medicare and evaluating choices has gotten very complicated for beneficiaries both those who are new to Medicare, as well as those who maybe try to do what Medicare recommends that all beneficiaries do every year, which is to compare plans during the open enrollment period. This year, for example, the average person on Medicare confronted more than 60 Medicare private plan choices, including both standalone prescription drug plans and Medicare Advantage plans. Next slide, please. And so it's very fair to ask, how is it possible to do a good job comparing options when plans vary along so many different dimensions? On the drug plan side, premiums, deductibles, covered drugs, tier placement, cost sharing, preferred pharmacy networks, prior authorization requirements, star ratings, all of these features vary from one plan to another. For Medicare Advantage plans, there's variation in premiums, cost sharing for Medicare covered benefits, provider networks, extra benefits, and the scope of coverage for those benefits, quality ratings, prior authorization requirements, plus all of the ways that drug coverage varies in standalone drug plans. So it's really no wonder that we find in our analysis that most beneficiaries, in fact, do not compare plans during the open enrollment period but staying put can have real cost and access consequences. Next slide, please. 
Another main storyline that goes along with growing Medicare Advantage enrollment is that this has real financial implications for the Medicare program. Since per person spending is higher in Medicare Advantage than in traditional Medicare, and Medicare Advantage per person spending is growing faster. So Medicare is spending more for people in Medicare Advantage than it would if they were in traditional Medicare. This cuts against the grain of the one seemingly conventional wisdom that private plans should be lower cost because they can manage and coordinate care. That's the theory, but it's never actually played out that way in reality. Next slide, please. And so that leads me to the challenges related to Medicare spending and solvency. Next slide. Medicare's Part A Hospital Insurance Trust Fund, which is the pot of money that pays for hospitalizations and other Part A benefits, is currently scheduled to run dry in 2026. That's four years from now, not five years from now, as the title of this slide suggests. We don't have yet the 2022 projections from the Medicare trustees, but I don't think there's any reason for optimism to think that the depletion date will be any later than 2026, maybe 2027. But either way, it's a date not very far in the future. So what happens when the trust fund is depleted? It means there's not enough money to pay for hospital benefits in full. But as far as what will really happen, we'd be in uncharted territory since Congress has never allowed the trust fund to reach a zero dollar balance. New revenues, lower spending, or some combination is likely to be needed unless Congress resorts to some sort of budget gimmicks to solve this problem. Next slide, please. The financial pressures on Medicare are being driven in part by an aging population which means more beneficiaries and older beneficiaries who tend to be higher cost than younger beneficiaries. Growth in healthcare spending per person has also contributed to higher total Medicare spending. And that growth in healthcare spending is influenced by increasing volume and use of services, by new technologies and by rising healthcare prices. These factors will all continue to play a role in Medicare spending growth moving forward. Next slide, please. And as, as Medicare spending increases, so too do the out-of-pocket costs that people on Medicare pay in the form of higher premiums and deductibles. Factoring in premiums for Medicare Part B and deductibles for Part A and Part B hospital and physician services, these costs combined have increased from 15% of the average Social Security benefit in 2002 to 19% in 2022. And the Medicare trustees project that these costs will account for an increasing share of Social Security benefits in the future. Next slide, please. So I don't want to end on such a dreary note. So let me instead reinforce the fact that Medicare is an incredibly popular program. It enjoys broad bipartisan support, which is a rare thing these days. And the vast majority of people on Medicare report being highly satisfied with the quality of care they receive. So while there are real challenges facing Medicare and legitimate concerns about the direction of the program, it's important to keep a focus on how vital a role the program plays in providing coverage and access to care for tens of millions of Americans today and will do so for even more in the future, which underscores the importance of tackling these challenges head on. Next slide, please. I encourage everyone to visit our website, kff.org, where you can access many of the resources that we drew on for the information in these slides, including our new interactive on Medicare spending, our work on Medicare Advantage and Part D plans, and many other resources. Thank you again very much.
Thank you, Juliet. What a wonderful overview of both the promise and challenges facing this program. And I have to say that uh, the Center for Medicare Advocacy is extraordinarily uh, grateful for the work that you and your colleagues at Kaiser Family Foundation provide. Without it, without that data, without that background and objective information, our advocacy on behalf of the Medicare program and on the behalf of the people who rely on it to open doors to healthcare would not be possible. So thank you so very much for joining us today, doing quite such a spectacular job, pitch hitting at the last minute. Thank you. Our true partner. Thank you so much, Juliet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy to join you. So now we'll move on to our first panel, which is going to be moderated by policy attorney Kata Cortez from the Center for Medicare Advocacy to talk about enhancing Medicare for all its beneficiaries, which you're beginning to see a theme um, coming through in this presentation. I'm gonna let Kata introduce her panel, but I do wanna thank the sponsors for this panel, AARP, Alzheimer's Association, Santa Fe Group, and SEIU. I know you'll be, uh, all who are listening, stimulated and energized and educated by this wonderful group of experts who are doing all they can to make Medicare and healthcare fully available for all older people and people with disabilities. And now the wonderful Kata Cortez, policy attorney at the Center for Medicare Advocacy. Kata? Thank you, Judy. Welcome everyone to the first panel discussion of the ninth annual National Voices of Medicare Summit and Senator Jay Rockefeller Lecture, Enhancing Medicare for All Beneficiaries. At the Center for Medicare Advocacy's annual summit, we take the opportunity to celebrate Medicare and all this program has done to improve the lives of older adults and their families, including lifting millions out of poverty, integrating hospitals, and supporting aging with dignity. As we reflect on one of our nation's foundational social insurance programs, we also keep an eye toward the future and how we can enhance the program, fill in gaps in coverage, and expand the program in ways that would improve quality of life, care, and outcomes for all beneficiaries. It is through this lens that we will begin our presentation from our wonderful panel after I briefly introduce them. For their detailed bios, please look to the summit program. First, we will hear from Dr. Gretchen Jacobson, Vice President of the Medicare Program at the Commonwealth Fund, where she is responsible for developing strategy and program plans for advancing Medicare initiatives and understanding and maintaining a view of developments and policy initiatives within the Medicare program. Next to present will be Dr. Frank Lynn, who is the Director of the Cochlear Center for Hearing and Public Health and a professor at Johns Hopkins University. He has translated his clinical experiences caring for patients with hearing loss into foundational public health research and federal policy. The third presentation will be from Dr. Linda Neeson, Vice Provost for Oral Health Affairs for Kansas City University and founding Dean and Professor for the Kansas City University College of Dental Medicine in Joplin, Missouri. Her career includes serving as a clinician, caring for medically complex and older adults at several VA medical centers. Welcome to the panel. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Gretchen Jacobson. Thank you very much, Kata. Uh, one moment. It is a real pleasure to be here. Um, I will provide an overview of the challenges Medicare beneficiaries face with affording care and the gaps in Medicare's coverage. So while Medicare provides substantial coverage and helps to make care more affordable for beneficiaries, many people in Medicare still face challenges affording the care they need. The data I'm showing here from a survey that the Commonwealth Fund conducted last year among people ages 60 or older. On the left here, you can see that people who are age 65 or older, all of whom are on Medicare, generally reported spending less out of pocket than younger adults with other insurance coverage. And that could include Medicaid, employer-sponsored coverage, or another source of coverage. On the right side, you can see that a significant number of Medicare beneficiaries reported skipping needed care due to its costs. 
For instance, on the far right, you can see that 15% of people reported skipping a needed visit to the dentist due to its cost. And this highlights that the high cost of care have real implications for people. And you can see the result in people not getting the care that they need. The costs of Medicare and the gaps in care are felt most acutely by American Indian beneficiaries and Black beneficiaries. About half of American Indian beneficiaries and about one third of Black beneficiaries were underinsured in 2018, meaning that they spent 10% or more of their income on health care. This again illustrates that Medicare's coverage is insufficient for many beneficiaries and its gaps greatly financially affect some beneficiaries. On average, people on Medicare spent about $3,000 out of pocket on healthcare in 2018. And this does not include any premiums they pay for Part B, Part D, or supplemental coverage. As you can see in the orange slices here, for dental expenses and long-term care, nearly half of Medicare beneficiaries' out-of-pocket expenses were for services that are not covered by Medicare. As I've alluded to, Medicare has significant gaps in its coverage, and these gaps have real cost implications for beneficiaries. Starting on the left side here, Medicare does not cover basic dental care, hearing aids, or eyeglasses. There's also no out-of-pocket cap or limit on what beneficiaries pay out-of-pocket for Part A and Part B services in traditional Medicare. For Part D, there is a soft cap of 5%, when people reach the catastrophic coverage phase, but that 5% coinsurance can add up to a lot in some cases. Medicare also does not cover long-term care. And there are some programs, including the Medicare Savings Program and the Part D Low Income Subsidy Program that help um, provide help with Medicare's premiums and cost sharing requirements, but the income and asset limits for these can be quite restrictive. And finally, Medigap, which can greatly help people in traditional Medicare to make their out-of-pocket expenses more predictable. But Medigap can be difficult for people to get, and they can be denied policies or subject to underwriting if they're outside certain issue periods of time. As you can see, all of these gaps can significantly affect Medicare beneficiaries. I mentioned that Medicare does not cover basic dental care, hearing aids, or eyeglasses, and these are needs that affect beneficiaries on a daily basis. So this shows that the percent of beneficiaries who have trouble hearing a doctor, trouble seeing, or have difficult or difficulty eating solid foods because of their teeth. On the far left, we can see that 21% of beneficiaries, about one in five, had trouble hearing their doctor, and 39% had trouble seeing. 22%, again, close to one in five, had trouble eating solid foods because of their teeth. These problems are even more prevalent among lower income beneficiaries, with more than one third of people with incomes below poverty having trouble hearing their doctor or having difficulty eating because of their teeth. One question that arises is, do Medicare Advantage plans improve affordability for Medicare beneficiaries and to what extent? The vast majority of Medicare Advantage plans to start with include some dental coverage, eyeglasses, or hearing benefits. But the coverage for these benefits is important to realize is typically quite limited. And plan and release can also pay an additional premium for these coverage. They also may be restricted to certain provider um, networks as well for these coverage, in addition to the provider networks that they have um, for their Part A and Part B coverage. Medicare Advantage plans can also provide in-house supports, such as supports for caregivers or in-home devices, which can help beneficiaries stay in their home safely. However, to date, relatively few plans have chosen to offer these benefits. And finally, all Medicare Advantage plans are required to have out-of-pocket limits. However, only a minority of beneficiaries reach these limits by design, and the limits only include cost sharing for Part A and Part B benefits. They do not include Part D cost sharing, and they do not include cost sharing for any supplemental benefits like dental checkups. For many beneficiaries though, having this out-of-pocket cap provides them some peace of mind, knowing that their cost obligations are not unlimited. 
It's also worth noting that Medicare Advantage plans are paid an average of $164 per enrollee per month to provide extra benefits not covered by Medicare. And these payments to plans for extra benefits are part of why they are paid more than it costs to cover similar people under traditional Medicare. Medicare Advantage plans have also faced challenges recently, particularly with their dental benefits and mental health coverage, which is quite concerning, especially for people in these plans. And here are some of these headlines. As you can see there's quite a lot from recently. So what are some ways that Medicare could be improved? So first, could consider adding benefits, including dental, hearing, and vision, to traditional Medicare. Another way is adding in-home supports, similar to Medicare Advantage, to the traditional Medicare benefit, so that all beneficiaries could have access to these benefits, regardless of which plan they enroll in. Another is raising the income and assets limits to provide more people help with Medicare's premiums and cost sharing. And then another option would be adding out a pocket limit or a hard cap to Part D coverage. And then finally, improving Medigap coverage and guaranteed issue rights for that coverage. And then here are some additional resources on these topics from the Commonwealth Fund. Thank you very much. I would now uh, have the pleasure of turning it over to Frank Lynn to speak with us more about um, hearing benefits. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, let me just go ahead and share my slides now. Um, I still can't share from my side. I think Gretchen still may be sharing from her side. I'll pull mine up briefly. There we go. All right. So um, hello, everyone, and, and, and thank you again for being here. Uh, by way of brief introduction, I am a, I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins where I'm an ENT surgeon, but I spend the majority of my time directing a research center focused on hearing loss and aging and public health. And I'm going to take you through and uh, building off some of Gretchen's thoughts before about especially hearing loss and Medicare coverage. So um, to begin, I think probably many of us realize this hearing loss is really, really common, uh, basically doubles every age decade of life. So by the time we look at the Medicare beneficiary population, 65 and plus, that basically roughly about half to almost two thirds of all Medicare beneficiaries have a significant hearing loss. Now, from that perspective, I think for many years, the, the line of thought was, well, if everyone gets it, how could it be important, right? It's just a like common process of aging. It can't be that important then. But unfortunately, that we're fortunate to say that's been, that idea has been turned on its head over the last 10 years. Uh, this specifically is, uh, I think, one key study the Lancet Commission on Dementia charged with advising governments around the world about what are the major modifiable risk factors for dementia. Just a few years ago now, looking at all the existing literature, they concluded among all the known risk factors for dementia that hearing loss single-handedly was the single largest, most dominant risk factor. And the reason why we think it is, is through these direct pathways to which hearing loss actually increases dementia risk. So really taking um, a combination of hearing loss can't be that important to really thinking that it actually is critically important for the health of America's seniors as well as, as uh, healthcare costs. Now, in particular, I'm taking it to a next level now too. Uh, the National Alzheimer's Plan, the National Alzheimer's Project Act, just recently updated the very end of 2021 now, uh, December 27th, uh, that there's now an official recommendation that hearing loss, increasing access to hearing aids is a critical pri priority, mainly because of the impact that hearing loss has on dementia, as well as uh, building evidence that treating hearing loss may in fact lower this risk uh, for America's seniors. But uh, unfortunately, even with this recommendation in place, that obviously just came to place a few months ago, um, we can see historically the, the rate of hearing aid use in the United States is phenomenally low. The blue bar, who has hearing loss, a clinically significant hearing loss, and in the red, uh, the percent of people using hearing aids, which is roughly about 15, 1-5%. It's quite low. Uh, and a lot of people will say, well, this is because they're so expensive and things like that. But the bigger issue is that there's some very, very deep-rooted, uh, uh, I would say, underlying issues and federal policy that have led to hearing care um, being in this format where it's very, very expensive and very, very difficult to address. And these two key policies are one most relevant to this talk today. It's supposed to around Medicare. So when Medicare came to be with amendments to the Social Security Act in 1965, uh, diagnostic audiological tests, so seeing an audiologist get your hearing tested, that is covered with a physician's referral. 
but anything around hearing aids or related hearing care services like counseling, education, about how to use a hearing and other strategies to help you communicate better, those are actually complete statutory, written to law, statutory exclusions. Um, things like prosthetics, like cochlear implants, some implantable hearing devices for some uh, slightly more unusual uh, conductive hearing loss in the ear, those are covered, fortunately. But anything around the majority of hearing loss, which is the age-related hearing loss, hearing aids, hearing cares are statutory exclusions. So that's one key thing, to obviously, those services aren't covered by Medicare and the office has trickle down effects to all their private insurances too. Um, the second key piece of federal policy that shaped the current hearing care market is in 1977, the FDA uh, developed a special controls on hearing aids, regulating them as medical devices, which is appropriate. But then because of how those regulations came into play, it basically limits hearing aid sales only through a licensed provider. You can only buy hearing aids from an audiologist or an ENT like me or, or a hearing instrument specialist. You can't just go over the counter and buy it. And this made sense back in the 70s because the only way for a hearing aid to be safe and effective in that time period was for the hearing aid to be given and programmed by someone. And that probably doesn't carry forth to this day, but we'll go over that a little bit. All right. With that in mind, those two federal policies then have had implications for the current hearing care delivery model. So the delivery model fundamentally now is predicated on a gatekeeper. You have to either go through me or an audiologist or a hearing specialist to get a hearing. You just can't go buy one. And because of that, the way hearing aids are priced is fundamentally what we call a bundled model, where when you pay the $4,000 average cost for a pair of hearing aids, you're paying for the wholesale cost of the hearing aid, but you're also paying for all the associated services that audiologists are giving you that they're not reimbursed for, namely the education, the counseling, the program of the hearing aid for the next several years. That's not covered by insurance, hence you're bundling that into the cost that the end consumer receives. Um, you also have a very consolidated hearing aid market. You have five manufacturers around the world that control greater than 90% of the world hearing aid marketplace. The reason for that is because for a new manufacturer, let's say like a Bose or a Samsung or Apple, big consumer electronics manufacturer, enter the field, they really can't because they can't sell directly to consumers. They would have to break into a consolidated market where the hearing aid providers are already sort of, you know, have a contract already with the existing hearing aid manufacturer. So the key attributes that uh, of this hearing care delivery model, which is directly the product of these two older pieces of legislation. You have a very, very high cost model of hearing care. It's fundamentally a low volume, high margin model of care. You have very misaligned patient provider incentives. When an audiologist is seeing a patient, they're only gonna get paid essentially if they sell that patient a hearing aid. They're not being paid for anything else besides the hearing test. Anything they do on counseling, education, helping someone with a hearing is not being covered. So the audiologist always be fundamentally incentivized to sell a hearing aid, or they're not making any money when they see a patient. Um, Ultimately, it's poorly accessible. We can only get a hearing with a provider. And finally, there's significant barriers to entry for new hearing aid manufacturers. Companies, again, like Samsung, Apple, things like that, they would never be able to enter the hearing aid market as is now because they couldn't break in and sell directly to consumers. From the insurance coverage point of view, as we said before, Medicare doesn't cover anything around this. Um, we do see, as, as, as Gretchen mentioned before, about 50 to 60% of Medicare Advantage plans, essentially private insurance, do offer some hearing aid coverage but the beneficiaries are still on the hook for the vast majority of costs. These are usually contract out to a third party provider network of audiologists. Sometimes they're, these, these provider networks are actually owned by a hearing aid company. So in the end, you might get yeah, a few hundred dollar discount on your hearing aid per se, if you wanna call it a discount. In the end cost, uh, Amber Willink and our team looked at an analysis several years ago now, where you see about for Medicare Advantage benefits or the hearing aid benefit, they're still paying essentially about 80% of the cost out of pocket though. So there is slight savings, but it's marginal at best. And you may still be better off going to like a Costco, for instance, which actually does a very good job of hearing aid sales and will be a lot cheaper than even going through your insurance network sometimes. All right. So fortunately, this has begun to change. These two key pieces of legislation. Um, the Over-the-Counter Hearing Act of 2017, this is fundamentally updating historical uh, FDA regulations. And this was really a result of a bipartisan legislation that was triggered by uh, the White House PCAS, President's Council of Advisors of Science Technology Report in 2016, and also the National Academies Report about a year later. Um, during this process, I worked with Congress and the National Academies on both these reports. And the legislation that came out of it that got passed in 2017, it fundamentally instructs the FDA to re-regulate hearing aids and to specifically create an over-the-counter category for hearing aids so that new market entrants, like essentially like the Apple, Samsung, you know, Philips, could enter the market and directly sell hearing aids to consumers. The draft regulation was just released a few months ago with finalization by the end of this year. Now, the implications are important. It basically leads to increased competition for hearing aids, ultimately consumer access directly to affordable over-the-counter hearing aids for those with mild to moderate hearing loss. 
That's a vast majority of hearing loss that would cover about probably about 85% of Medicare beneficiaries have a mild to moderate hearing loss. So that's all great news, but there's some huge missing gaps still, which are significant though. One key thing is that if you're a 75 year old person, you may not know what over-the-counter hearing to get. You may not know how to use them. You may not know how to even address your hearing loss. So the hearing care services that an audiologist, those essential services that an audiologist provide are still not being covered by insurance. And those would still be out of pocket if seniors can even access those services and so they're not readily available right now, right? So that's one issue is people who theoretically could benefit from OTC hearing aids won't because they won't access the services. The other, other missing gap is that individuals who have greater than a moderate hearing loss, people who are moderately severe to a severe hearing loss, they will not be able to benefit from OTC hearing aids because they're, they won't be suitable, they won't be strong enough, and they'll need prescription hearing aids, which still aren't obviously being covered by insurance. Now, um, I wish I had better news here, but we did make progress past year. It ultimately got stalled in Congress right now. The Build Back Better Act, if I may be aware, was introduced last year in Congress. And of the $1.75 trillion in spending, uh, there was a $35 billion carve out specifically for a Medicare hearing benefit. And what this would have done if it had been passed is it um, would have covered prescription hearing aids for those with greater than moderate hearing loss. If you had a mild to moderate, you'd be responsible for buying your own over-the-counter hearing aids. Um, but it would cover prescription hearing aids for people with more severe hearing loss. And fundamentally, it also would move the statutory exclusion on hearing care services. So if you've got your own OTC hearing aids, so let's say tongue-in-cheek, your own Apple hearing in the future, you could still see an audiologist to help you learn how to use it, to program it, to adjust it to your lifestyle so you can actually hear and communicate better. Um, as all of us know now, the Build Back Better Act is stalled in Congress. Uh, we're hoping there may be an opportunity to resurrect at least the Medicare hearing benefit later next year when the results of a, a major NIH-funded uh, trial, clinical trial called the ACHIEVE trial is actually testing, in fact, whether or not treating hearing loss in seniors actually reduce the risk of dementia Part of, uh, dementia and also healthcare costs. So we're hoping if there's a positive from the trial that might serve as an impetus point to reintroduce this benefit into, into Congress once again. So uh, I'll finish up there. Thank you all for your attention. And I'll turn it over now to uh, Linda Neeson now to talk more about uh, dental coverage in, uh, in Medicare. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and let me share my slides as well. Let me go to my good morning, good afternoon. So it's a pleasure to be with you. I'd like to talk about the case for a dental benefit in Medicare. Um, and I was very interested to hear Dr. Jacobson say that 15% of seniors skipped a dental visit because of the, the cost. So this afternoon, I want to take you through an overview of the dental care market, uh, why a dental benefit is important, not only to improve access, but also to reduce oral inflammation, and then talk specifically about the dental benefit. And I'd like to make set forth a premise that some of the money to fund a dental benefit in Medicare is already in the Medicare system. Uh, and if we look at dental insurance driving uh, use of dental services, what we see is that children, we have 12% of our children who are uninsured, and that's really a tribute to the Affordable Care Act and the Children's Health Insurance Program, as well as Medicare benefit, Medicaid benefits for children. Working adults and older adults are not so successful. Working adults, we have 28% of working adults who are uninsured and 62% of seniors uh, who are uninsured, which is why they often skip dental visits. To give you a sense of the dental care market, dentistry is about $140 billion industry. 2019, it was $145 billion. In 2020, we saw some contraction because of the pandemic when dental offices were closed for anywhere from six weeks to three months. The per capita spending for dental care is about $442 per year. That was 2019, about $430 uh, a year in 2020. But if this, you look at this next slide, and if you look on the left, that's 2019, the right is 2020 data, 43% of dental services are reimbursed through private dental insurance, with 42% reimbursed out of pocket. 19, 13% uh, or $19 billion is government-funded dental care, so the government doesn't fund a lot of dental care. And 1% is other care. That might be 
TRICARE, that might be other benefits. In 2020, the distribution changed a little bit, but primarily the two big reimbursers, private health insurance accounted for 42% and out-of-pocket decreased to 37% because people didn't go to the dentist. Um, they were worried about it initially when the pandemic started. Uh, government reimbursement stayed the same at 13%, but you see an increase in the yellow, 7%, of other, and that was the Paycheck Protection Program um, that basically were support, government support provided to dentists to maintain uh, their dental office staff when the offices were closed. What we know about demand for dental care is that income and education are proxies for the use of dental services. If you were a health economist, you might describe this dental care as a luxury good. As your income increases, your education increases, your consumption of dental services also increases. In a report called Oral Health in America that was recently released by the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, they also identified a use of services in children Working adults, we know working adults without dental insurance have difficulty obtaining dental care. Low-income older adults have difficulty accessing dental care. And adults in long-term care facilities have significant difficulties accessing dental care. Most long-term care facilities have no dental dentist on staff in a long-term care facility. And what the, what the effect on oral health of individuals, if you look at this slide, uh, you'll see the blue bars, that's individuals who are over 65, the percent of the 65 plus population who've lost six or more teeth, compared to the red bar, which is the percent of the population over 65 who have lost all of their teeth by income. So low income is on the left side of the slide, higher income is on the right side of the slide. And what you see is you see that red line going from 28% of low income older adults have lost all of their teeth compared to 5.7 or 6% of older adults with an annual income of $50,000 or more. So again, as your income increases, um, the risk of losing your teeth decreases. Uh, complete edentialism or total loss of teeth is now a problem that we see to a much greater significance in lower income older adults. If we think about the supply of dentist, dentists, we have about 200,000 dentists in the United States right now in 2021. The American Dental Association has a 60% market share. However, that is decreasing. The number of women is increasing. We've gone from 24% in 2010 to now 35% in 2020. The diversity of dentists do not reflect the diversity of the U.S. population. And if you look at this slide, you'll see on the left, 60% of the population is white compared to 70% of the dentists who are white. The green color is 18% of the population is Hispanic compared to 6% of the population of dentists are Hispanic. The orange color are our African-American population, our black population, represents 12% of the population, but only 3.8% of the dentists. Uh, and that military blue color, 5.6% of our U.S. population is Asian American, but dentists, 18% of the dentists are Asian American. So we see a, an increase in representation of, among Asian Americans. So if we had a senior dental insurance benefit, it would increase access but it also has the, pop, the potential to offer some biologic uh, benefits. By decreasing oral inflammation, oral infection leads to oral inflammation. And if we can decrease oral inflammation, we can decrease um, systemic inflammation uh, and possibly reduce medical costs, hospitalization, and drug costs. And oral inflammation, we know from recent studies, can affect a number of downstream organs. So starting at the um, right top in the one o'clock position, you'd see oral health, poor oral health related to cardiovascular disease, to colorectal cancer, to uh, respiratory tract infections, to adverse pregnancy outcomes, to diabetes and insulin resistance, to even Alzheimer's disease. And a study that was in Science Advances in 2019 showed the Porphyrmonas gingivalis, which is one of the periodontal pathogens, was found in Alzheimer's brains, um, the, the brains of Alzheimer's patients. They went on to look at Porphyrmonas gingivalis producing 
a, a small molecule called a ginger pain, which is neurotoxic. They then did a study that looked at if they blocked that ginger pain, it, it de decreased the, the, pro the damage to the neuron. So, you know, you certainly don't think about having, um, you know, not getting your teeth cleaned or having periodontal disease as contributing to Alzheimer's disease. But in fact, these data suggested that that in fact was the case. So as a result of some of the scientific data, we saw a number of clinical trials that were done in insurance companies that basically developed a number of preventive programs for patients who had various chronic diseases. So these insurance studies provided scaling and root planning or periodontal therapy twice a year, a deep cleaning, so to speak, for clients who had various chronic diseases, um, congestive, or excuse me, they had type 2 diabetes, coronary artery disease, um, cerebrovascular disease. Some of them even looked at rheumatoid arthritis. What they found in each of the studies as they provided this periodontal benefit, they found that the study saved costs on the medical side of the house in either hospitalizations, medical costs, or even drug usage. And the savings were all in the, at a similar magnitude, anywhere from $1,500 to $2,000 for the most part. Uh, and as a result, the insurance companies have been acting on these data and are realizing the cost savings uh, on the medical side of the house when they provide the dental benefit. So quite, quite honestly, you think a dental benefit in Medicare may result in some cost savings to the Medicare program as the Medicare program reduces oral inflammation. And, and as you heard, if we look at the percent of people on Medicare who have no dental insurance, 47% of those on Medicare have no dental coverage, 26% participate in the Medicare Advantage plan, and we know they're highly variable. 16% um, have some private plans and 8% have Medicaid. We also know that dental benefits serve as a financial barrier to people. And you saw Dr. Jacobson present this. Only 4% in children, so apparently we're doing better uh, improving access for our children, but our working age population, it's 18% and 13% for our population 65 plus. So with the Build Back Better plan, um, the Santa Fe group, I'm a member of the Santa Fe group, uh, we've been working to advocate for and educate about the, the importance of a dental benefit in Part B. Uh, and as to that end, we developed a dent a standard benefit plan using kind of the process that Medicare uh, currently uses. Uh, but also at the same time, the American Dental Association put forth a um, Part T, uh, which was supposedly a, a dental benefit in Medicare. In the Part B, we all know the dental benefit is because of the age of the individual, not uh, provided as a result of income. In the dental benefit plan that we outlined, we structured it so that it was similar to the fee schedule that Part B currently uses with a 70% usual and customary rate. The California Dental Association actually had a task force to look at a Part B benefit in Medicare that provided dental coverage. And, and was advocating for that approach. And then we know a number of the consumer groups also advocated, including the Part B dental benefit. The, the Part T the program that was, advocate, that was advocated by the American Dental Association um, was a little bit disingenuous, quite honestly. The American Dental Association has a very active lobby group. It's a very sophisticated um, lobby activity that we have. We, uh, the American Dental Association, I am a member, and the ADA owns two houses on Capitol Hill to educate and entertain Congress members. Um, their Part T basically was a benefit provided to seniors at 300% poverty or less. Now, our, our lobbyists understand that Medicare doesn't work that way. Uh, it also didn't, wasn't clear how the Part T benefit would have any effect on Medicare Advantage plans. And probably one of the biggest benefits of having a dental benefit in Part B is that all of the Medicare Advantage plans then have to provide that benefit. And right now, 
as you've heard, the Medicare Advantage plans have a, you know high variability in the dental benefit that's provided because there is no standard benefit in Part B. Uh, it also wasn't clear the fee schedule and the ADA kind of rallied the grassroots and every morning I got an email from the American Dental Association that essentially scared me. Um, and, and basically it, it appeared to scare Congress too because they told Congress that the dentists wouldn't participate because dentists weren't participating in Medicaid. Well, we all know Medicaid is a very different program than Medicare. And in all of that lobbying, what they failed to mention was that there was a $24 billion funds allocated for this dental benefit, uh, which would, if which would result theoretically in, <clears throat> excuse me, an almost $150,000 increase in practice revenues if you just estimated based on 160,000 dentists who would participate. But probably more important, you know, as a clinician who cared for many patients who were diabetic, who could get diabetic, who could get their diabetes treated by their physician, could get their diabetic um, cardiovascular disease treated, could get their diabetic eye disease treated, could get their diabetic foot care treated, but they couldn't get their diabetic periodontal disease treated um, because they didn't have dental insurance. Um, it would finally, a dental benefit in Medicare would certainly reconnect the mouth to the rest of the body. It would show that dentistry was as important as podiatry, which has been in Medicare for years, and the podiatrists aren't complaining, but more importantly, it would be essential to, to overall health care. Um, now, because that is stuck, as Dr. Lynn mentioned, um, there's discussions about medically necessary dental care. And medically necessary dental care would enable some individuals to receive dental care if they were receiving treatment for a procedure that was already approved uh, in Medicare. This clearly isn't as comprehensive as a dental benefit in Part B, and it wouldn't help bring consistency to a dental benefits in the Medicare Advantage plan. So, so with that, I just want to close. There was a wonderful article in the AMA Journal of Ethics by uh, Dr. Marco Vujicic and Dr. Chelsea Fossey. Dr. Vujicic serves as the health economist for the American Dental Association's Health Policy Institute. And his conclusion was that we've made progress treating children, vulnerable children, but working age adults and seniors have great disparities, and these disparities have only increased by income and race. And then it's time to treat dental care as essential in U.S. health policy for all ages, not just children. So thank you. And now I am going to invite my colleagues, Dr. Jacobson and Dr. Lynn uh, and Dr. Cortez, uh, to join us back, and we will open the floor for discussion. Thank you all so much. And uh, we have a few questions from the audience that we'll, we'll get started, but I also urge panelists to, to please feel free to ask each other questions and to, to chime in as well. Uh, so the first one is for Dr. Neeson. Um, do you think that there's an increased awareness that oral health is part of overall health it should be integrated more into medical care and that this idea that dental care is somehow separate from the rest of the body is becoming outdated. And how are medical and dental schools addressing the medical dental integration? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, the separation of dentistry and medicine is an accident of history. In 1840, when you know two physicians wanted to start a dental school at the University of Maryland in Baltimore and the University of Maryland Medical School wasn't interested, so they started their own dental school called the Baltimore College of Dental Surgery, and we've been separate ever since. I think there is a greater recognition because of the science um, that you know, oral health is related to overall health, that the body conserves mechanisms. Um, and what we're starting to see in dental school, we're seeing more interprofessional education, that we're educating physician, medical students and dental students, um, along with perhaps nursing students, dental hygiene students. We're starting to see um, the teams work together. What we really need is an integrated electronic health record. Uh, I was a clinician in the VA. Uh, for 30 years, and I have to tell you, I love the VA's integrated electronic health record because that made it so much easier to, to communicate with all of my colleagues, whether it was the pharmacist, the physician, the physical therapist, all those notes were in the patient's chart. So an integrated electronic health record certainly will help in addition to integrating the medical, dental, nursing, pharmacy, physical therapy, occupational therapy students together. 
Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Jacobson. Um, can you tell us more about the need for expanded Medigap access for beneficiaries in an out-of-pocket cap in traditional Medicare in order to have more balance between traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage? Yes, uh, so let's start with Medigap. So there are select periods when people are guaranteed to be issued a Medigap policy that they um, want. And um, some of those periods are expanded in some states, and um, but not in all states. And so in most states, um, there's only select periods when you can get a Medigap policy without underwriting or be denied for it. Um, and that Medigap policies then help to make the costs in traditional Medicare more predictable. Um, similarly, and in I should say in that way, they also provide a lot of financial security to beneficiaries. And in the same way, um, an out-of-pocket cap for Part A and Part B would also provide more financial security for Medicare beneficiaries because their costs would no longer be unlimited. And that's also what I said with regard to the out-of-pocket limits that Medicare Advantage plans have. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, really important issue. <laughs> um, I have a question for Dr. Lin. Um, as Dr. Neeson mentioned, we know that the ADA pushed back against expanded oral health coverage in Medicare during the Build Back Better uh, debates. Was there pushback from certain groups or industry in the same manner regarding audiology, or can you um, explain to us what happened there? Yeah, so I think it's... Um... Great question. It, it's a mixed bag. I mean, there, there are multiple different stakeholders involved here. There are the uh, sort of professional groups, audiologists, ENTs, and things like that. So the professional groups. And then you have the hearing aid manufacturers. So um, I think overall among, you know, not to, there's many different audiology groups and, and, and physician groups related to hearing care. I think overall, all of them were in general supportive about the legislation. Where the devil's in the details around the coverage, though, really comes not with the legislation, but with eventually the rulemaking process if it got passed and went to Medicare in terms of what the coverage limits are and things like that. So I think there will be more of a battle around that point. But the legislation, I think overall, the professional bodies were very supportive. Where there was a lot of opposition actually was from the hearing aid industry, though. Um, the hearing aid industry right now, the way it's predicated, it's, it's fundamentally a low volume, high margin business where uh, they don't sell very many, but they make a high margin each one. When you go to a model where now Medicare is covering hearing aids for a good portion of Americans. On top of that, you have competition against with OTC hearing aids that are coming to market from consumer electronics manufacturers. It's it's very disturbing to the current business model among the, the five major hearing aid manufacturers. I think there's also there's a lot of actually um, behind the scenes uh, opposition from that front, uh, less so from the professional groups actually. Thank you. We have another question for Dr. Lin and Dr. Neeson. Um, Dr. Jacobs had mentioned the challenges beneficiaries encounter with MA plans, such as limited networks. Mm. Do you have a sense of the provider perspective regarding MA plans? Um, so I mean, I'll go first. I know for, for the hearing side. So um, a, a lot of uh, the MA plans right now, they, have, they, they come in different flavors. One is sometimes they'll just give you a fixed benefit, a thousand dollars. You can apply every three years, for instance, right? That's pretty much it's not wedding anywhere. It's just a sort of cash benefit you get if you get a hearing aid and get reimbursed for it. Uh, that's not as common as the typical one, which is um, you have a benefit, but it's through a provider network. It's some third-party provider network, which most many of these third-party provider networks, I said, are, are owned by a hearing aid manufacturer, which owns their own retail clinics, which then employs their own hearing aid dispensers and audiologists. So um, it's, it's very much sleight of hand with the coverage there. A lot of the hearing professionals who work for those companies, um, it's a mixed bag. I mean, you're, you're, being, you're basically being employed by the hearing manufacturer to sell a product essentially in the end. So I, I think they have less comment than, you know, let's say the independent audiologists who are abhorred sometimes by uh, what is covered under those plans, which is really uh, very little in fact. So it, it's, it's coverage and I would say coverage and name only per se. And that's, and that's very similar to the dental benefit. The dental benefit is highly variable and the network for the dentist is limited. Um, so, but the Medicare Advantage plans make a lot of money 
by often, you know, selling Medicare Advantage plans and using the dental benefit as a loss leader, so to speak. Um, but the belief is it's not really a loss leader. That, you know, if if the Medicare Advantage plans, and I wrote this at $169 to $164 per enrollee per month. So that's a significant amount of money. And you saw the the per, you know, per capita cost for dental insurance, only like $440. And even if you figure there's a 50% utilization, so double that. So it might be $800. They're certainly making money off of the Medicare Advantage plans because the network of dentists is often limited. And actually some of the opponents to Part B in in a dental benefit in Part B were also the Medicare Advantage insurance companies because they see that that's a very profitable product right now for them. And if there's a dental benefit in Part B, then there may not be as much of an interest in buying those plans. Thank you. Uh, one more question for Dr. Neeson, and then I'll turn it over to Matt to see if he has any more from the audience. This question um, is about the dental workforce. Um, so if, if we are successful and can get an expansion of coverage in Medicare, do you think it would lead to an increase in dental providers and dental education to meet the demand of new patients, or do you think we'll still uh, be met with some resistance from providers? So, so right now, it's a very interesting time in dental education because we're seeing an increase in the number of dental schools. So we're going from about 6,000 graduates a year to maybe about 7,000 in the next five years. So the number of graduates will increase. The American Dental Association, Dr. Wojcic, did studies looking, did a survey of ABA members and found that there was a dichotomy between the older members who didn't want a dental benefit in Medicare and the younger members who were not afraid of it, who were, if there was a dental benefit in Medicare, would be willing to participate in it. Right now, dental the, the scare tactic that was used was that there's only about you know, 40%, and depending on the state you were in, it may be as little as 25% of the dentists participate in Medicaid. Well, Medicaid reimbursement sometimes is as low as 30 to 40 percent. Uh, and with dental practices having a 60 percent overhead, the dentists are not interested in participating. Um, with Medicare's reimbursement at a higher rate and with the younger, the younger dentists saying they're not, they're not as afraid of it, um, I think that we will see if there is a dental benefit in Part B, that more dentists will participate, particularly in Build Back Better. There was $124 billion. Um, that was that could be, you know, as much as $150,000 per year of new patient revenue for dentists. With the consolidation of dentistry in dental support organizations, so you've got some large group corporate practices, uh, I believe they will accept, they will participate in the Medicare program. So I believe that if a Part B passes, that there will be sufficient dental workforce uh, to provide the care that patients are seeking. That's good to hear. <laughs> um, I'll turn over to my colleague, Matt, to see uh, what additional questions we have um, from the audience. All right. Thanks very much, Kata. Uh, and of course, we do have additional questions. Uh, let's start with Mark Miller. Hi, Mark. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, how would the addition of dental and or hearing as standard Part B benefits impact program costs and enrollee premiums? Frank, do you want to take that? So, you know, I, I don't know, actually. I think that's um, when the CBO was looking at the Medicare hearing benefit, it was <laughs> Uh, the initial costing was $35 billion for it, um, but uh, there are a lot of different stipulations and assumptions going into that, uh, which were constantly in flux, actually, as the legislation was evolving through its, uh, it, you know, also got to pass through the Senate, pass through the House was in the Senate, still up for considerations of the level of coverage, things like that. So I think it was still unknown, but the initial costing from CBO was at $35 billion. Uh, how that trickles down to Medicare beneficiary costs, I think it had not gone to that stage yet. The, the Santa Fe group, which has been advocating, you know, for a dental benefit in Medicare, we actually did a cost study to look at it. And we had, had, had three different panels. We had a development panel, an advisory panel to, to develop a benefit so that a benefit that was similar to a private dental insurance benefit uh, and looked at the cost. And the cost as it came in 
providing dental benefits, and then at a reimbursement rate of about 70% UCR was about $30 per person per month. Now, we then looked at what that premium could be, and, and if it was for up to 200% or even 300% of poverty, it was zero, so that that the the individual who's at the 300% level, their premium would would be zero for that and then increase at the higher at the higher income levels the way the part b premium works now um, so it was certainly not and then we also built in a utilization rate of about 70 percent which is very high um, you know school teachers have the highest utilization of dental insurance and it's about you know a, a 70 70 percent rate so so it was a reasonable cost based on um, what we know about dental insurance today. And we had an advisory panel that reviewed all of these numbers. But, but we also have to keep in mind that the insurance company studies were showing that there's cost savings in the system, that you'd have decreased hospitalizations. The patients with diabetes who get a periodontal therapy, you know, save insulin costs, save hospitalization costs. So, so that wasn't accounted for. Uh, and and we know that there are, I believe that there's already some cost savings in the system uh, that would occur with a Part B. If there is, there's no question it's uncertain, uh, but but the magnitude is not out of, you know, it's not off the charts. It's not unreasonable. Thank you very much. Um, Stephanie asks, uh, you've mentioned Build Back Better. Are there any opportunities to remove statutory barriers to audiology services or any of these others separately uh, in the works? Yeah, great question. So um, Build Back Better not have an isolation. It was ultimately built off um, uh, HR3, uh, the Elijah Cummings Lower Drug Cost Now Act, which was enhanced which covered far more than and hearing, but that was in itself built on HR 4618, which was a Medicare Hearing Act of 2019, I believe, uh, or 18. Um, so there have always been, uh, at any given point, different competing bills throughout Congress um, uh, advocating for um, uh, Medicare hearing coverage in some shape or form. They come in various shapes and sizes, though. Some do, some are a little more than lip service. Um, the, the nice thing about the Build Back Better Act, though, which we're hoping that type of benefit goes for, is that leverage is the competitive marketplace. And what I mean by that, it does not cover hearing aids for everyone. It's going to leverage the over-the-counter hearing aid marketplace. So again, if you have a mild to moderate hearing loss, which is 85% of Medicare beneficiaries, you will be buying your own hearing aid, which to be reasonable, if you can get a pair of Apple AirPods for $200 now, that's eventually the cost point we're anticipating a lot of hearing aids will go to when you have scale in the over-the-counter marketplace. So it helps to... Um, how do you put share the cost between, I would think, patients and the private market rather than putting the complete onus on, on government. So I think uh, we particularly, and we, we're, we're huge advocates at, at, at Hopkins at the center, I direct of that benefit, mainly because it helps split the cost and the leverage the competitive marketplace. But other ones don't necessarily li lift entire statutory exclusion. So you might get some services, but hearing aids aren't covered at all. Um, so there are competing bills in Congress. There always have been. Uh, we're hoping something more like the, the Medicare hearing benefit bill back better eventually uh, is what gets through. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, it's kind of a two-part question. Um, and it is, uh, is the medically necessary discussion happening, just to clarify, with CMS, with Congress, with whom, uh, and can that medically necessary phrase be used for vision and hearing, as well as the dental benefit? Well, the medical necessary discussion is being held with CMS, and with the Department of Health and Human Services. And I'm going to toss it to Frank um, to yeah. see whether it can be include, you know, vision and hearing. So I'm not, actually, I don't know the language on vision. You know, hearing I know well, obviously. It's it's a long shot there, mainly because, you know, written into the Social Security Act Amendment, right, of establishing <laughs> you know, Medicare, it's a complete written statutory exclusion for hearing aids and related hearing care services. I think that's very, very hard to get around. Uh, anything on the on the rulemaking process because it's it's written to law so that their your hands are tied there until this until they're lifting the statutory exclusion on that one. All right, thank you. Not the hopeful answer maybe we were looking for. Yeah. Um, I think that takes us to about ten of here. Um, so uh, Kata, any concluding remarks from your panel? Just want to thank you all again for your presentation. Very informative, very helpful. 
Um, we really enjoyed it. And uh, I think we have a break now, um, but we look forward uh, to continuing these discussions. We have a lot of work still to do in the advocacy uh, for these expansions in Medicare. Um, and we continue to partner with, with all of you uh, to continue to work on that. So thank you again. Thank you all. And yes, we do have a break. And this is Judy Stein, a little bit of a voice here. Uh, up there I am. Uh, I want to call your attention during the break to the attendee page that you had a link on, um, that you got with your link to the program today, where we have additional materials um, regarding some of the key issues that we write about. In this case, uh, about Medicare Advantage, uh, we did a piece uh, with a major focus on Medicare Advantage a few weeks ago. We also provided uh, a report about a survey we did of 217 home health agencies across the country in 20 states and a special advanced preview for attendees at this summit. Uh, Chiplin Health and Medicare Fellow Cinnamon St. John at the Center for Medicare Advocacy has written a really remarkable report about telehealth and the Medicare population called Building a Foundation for the Virtual Healthcare Revolution. We are going to be issuing this on Monday, but there's a sneak preview for you folks available on the attendee page on our website. Hope you have a wonderful break and please come back to join us after a few minutes. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, panel. Uh, if I may add one more thing, not on that uh, attendee page, but going out to you in our follow-up will be copies of slides um, and uh, a, a link to the recorded program because we've been asked that several times in our questions. So just to clear that up, going out with the follow-up along with a little survey as to uh, what you thought of the summit. So thanks all for looking for that. Thank you all. It was a wonderful, wonderful panel. And uh, Grant and Linda, Linda and Frank, you're really esteemed and we're really grateful for having you give us your time and attention and expertise. Thank you. And thank you, Kata, for your wonderful moderating. Thank you for coming back and joining us after the break for this wonderful component of the summit. When we hear from the voices of folks who are helping people try to access the care they need through the Medicare program. Right now we have two. One is Eric Krupa, who's the attorney, who is an attorney at the Center for Medicare Advocacy in our Connecticut office prior to joining us. Eric was also an attorney at, with legal services in Maine, with the Connecticut Civil Rights Commission, and also uh, has done work throughout his life in helping folks who need access to the rights that they have not been afforded well. Paula Haney is a physical therapist who works to enhance function for older adults and people with disabilities and has done so for over 40 years. During her career, she has focused on concerns of people living with arthritis and is a longtime volunteer for the Arthritis Foundation. She works and lives in Wyndham, Connecticut, where she's a longtime member of the Board of Education and a former member of the Board of Finance. She's a graduate of the University of Connecticut. And I want to mention also that Eric also has degrees. He has a BA magna cum laude from Hunter College and a JD cum laude from Notre Dame Law School. Eric and Paula, um, thank you for joining us with the Voices of Medicare for this component. Eric, do you want to begin? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Judy. Uh, so good to be with everyone today. Uh, it's been great to hear everybody talking so far and looking forward to this next section. Uh, but as far as what we're going to talk about, a case that Paula and I worked on recently, uh, I had the pleasure of working with a client uh, with Paula who had referred her to the center. Um, and I'm just going to provide some brief background here and then turn it over to Paula, who's going to explain the case a little bit better from a clinical perspective. But in working with the client, the client was enrolled in a United Healthcare Medicare Advantage plan, and that was specific to retired uh, state of Connecticut employees. And this plan was unique in that it touted uh, unlimited, uh, and that was the wording from the materials, unlimited number of days in a skilled nursing facility. So this client was admitted to uh, the facility at which Paula works for short-term rehab following a hip replacement surgery. 
And despite this promise of an unlimited number of days in the facility, and despite the fact that she continued to receive intensive therapy, uh, she began receiving uh, notices of Medicare non-coverage from the plan uh, within about three weeks of admission to the facility. Um, so increasing her confusion was the fact that United wasn't issuing these notices directly. It was a company that they had acquired uh, less than three years ago, uh, Navi Health. And so the client, uh, with Paula's help and with everybody's help at the facility, was able to successfully challenge these notices, uh, Navi Health's attempts to terminate coverage. Uh, however, the notices, despite uh, successful appeals, continued on just about a weekly basis. Uh, coverage was eventually terminated at a point when the facility agreed continued intensive therapy was no longer necessary. Uh, but in total, over less than a four-month period, the client filed approximately a dozen appeals. Uh, so again, average out to a little less than one a week. Um, and then before I turn it over to Paula here, the last thing I'll say is just that this case is unique in that uh, the client, Paula, uh, and the facility were particularly resilient. Uh, according to a 2018 Office of Inspector General report, between 2014 and 2016, only 1% of Medicare Advantage denials were appealed by beneficiaries or providers. Uh, so decisions, uh, like in this case, made by, by Navi Health, by United Healthcare, uh, are often the final decision. Uh, so with that being said, I'll turn it over to Paula to talk about her experiences more generally with Navi Health, and then in particular this case. Okay, thank you, Eric. And, and Judith, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to share our experience. As Judith says, I have been a physical therapist for over 40 years, and much of that time has been spent working in skilled nursing facilities. Recently, here at St. Joseph Living Center, we were introduced to United Healthcare's adoption of Navi Health, which uh, is an artificial intelligence based decision making tool that uses historic patient decision-making um, that uses, I'm sorry, uh, patient outcomes to determine a patient's eligibility for skilled care and length of stay. Navi Health uses such phrases as patients like you to establish expected outcomes for mobility, self-care, and problem-solving ability. But what Navi Health does not take into consideration are the comorbidities and complications of surgery or illness that impact the usual rehab experience. It has become increasingly the case that patients who might meet Navi Health's expected rehab journey spend one to two days in an acute care setting and then go home. Uh, they go home with some services, maybe family members, with rehab that may be three times a week. These aren't the patients that come to our facility. The patients that come to us have significant comorbidities, such as diabetes, cardiac, and respiratory issues, just to name a few, or complications of surgery or illness for which they were admitted to the hospital. These issues impact a patient's rehab, usually requiring a longer stay less intensive program, but no less skilled as the therapist must modify the treatment. As a result, we have experienced an increase in the request for updated reviews from Navi Health. While weekly reviews begin the process, weekly soon becomes four to five days. While Navi Health criteria seemed both vague and arbitrary, the denials for coverage began. Many of our patients are unable to understand the appeals process and don't always have the family members to assist them in the process. And we always encourage our patients to appeal. And most denials are indeed overturned. However, when the denials are overturned, it seems the requests for review increase in frequency and the days allotted for coverage seem to decrease. What we have never experienced with traditional Medicare or other Medicare Advantage plans is phone calls that are placed from Navi Health to our patients. Um, it happens quite frequently with particular patients. 
Um, and if the patient isn't able to take the call or is declines taking the call, the calls are placed to the family. And these calls start discussing discharge plans. Have you thought about arranging for 24-hour care at home? Or have you planned to apply for Medicaid? When these calls come so frequently, our patients become concerned. They become anxious, fearful. What's going to happen to me? What am I going to lose my home? As the denials are overturned, it becomes an emotional roller coaster. We see changes in our patients as they have increased difficulty focusing on the rehab, which is so important. Um, they become weaky, weepy, and upset. And there are many times that they will decline their therapy the day following these calls because they're so upset. For us as providers, the amount of documentation required for review, the gathering of paperwork, and preparation to send requested paperwork within Navi Health's usual 24-hour time frame takes time for our rehab and our nursing staff, time that would be much better spent caring for our patients. I'd like to introduce you to one of our patients covered by United Healthcare, reminding you, as Eric said, that United Healthcare allows for unlimited covered days in a skilled nursing facility. Ms. M lived functionally independent on her own in her own home. She was, uh, she had some progressive osteoarthritis, which was making it more difficult for her to get around and to be able to complete her daily tasks. Ms. M's son did live with her, but his own health problems required that he be placed in a skilled nursing facility for long-term care. Nearing 80 years old, Ms. M opted to have a total hip replacement in order to improve her mobility. However, her degenerative hip had progressed to the point that surgery was much more difficult, much more involved, resulting in nerve damage, um, with foot drop, and the patient was made what is termed toe-touch weight-bearing. She was not able to put full weight on her leg, which for an older person with obesity and osteoarthritis in their shoulders, essentially non-weight-bearing, which is difficult for just about anyone. Ms. M was admitted to our facility on November 20th, 2021. The first request for review came less than 10 business days after admission. Based on documentation, she was given five covered days more. The next review was five days later, and Ms. M was given three covered days. In the meantime, Navi Health recommendations were already being made that Ms. M consider arranging for a paid 24-hour caregiver at home or applying for Medicaid for respite care. During her stay, Ms. M tested positive for COVID, was in quarantine, and had limited tolerance for rehab. Ms. M had an orthopedic appointment and was hoping to become weight-bearing, but the appointment was rescheduled. Thus, non-weight-bearing status continued right through her next orthopedic follow-up that did happen on January 24th, and it wasn't until February 15th, that is nearly four months later, that Ms. M could begin weight-bearing and start her ambulation training. Ms. M received her ankle foot brace, or orthosis, um, to correct her foot drop and was making terrific progress with mobility and self-care. However, the denials continued, Ms. M appealed, and all were overturned. We completed a home evaluation because she had been making such great progress and found the single issue that was preventing Ms. M from returning home was her inability to put her brace on by herself. Without someone to assist her, Ms. M was unable to safely transfer and walk without the brace. 
She continued her rehab on a reduced frequency to work on brace application, and this concluded her skilled spell of coverage. As Ms. M has been unable to return home at this time, she has had to apply for Medicaid to continue her stay at our facility. She does not have the finances to pay for services at home. Unfortunately, this is not the only case that we have experienced with United Healthcare's use of Navi Health here at St. Joseph Living Center. It is our concern that the use of artificial intelligence in establishing criteria for coverage will primarily serve the insurance company opposed to allowing our patients to reach their maximum potential. Our elders deserve the very best care we can provide to ensure their quality of life, preserve their independence to the best of theirs and our ability, and be treated with dignity. It is our hope that the use of artificial intelligence in determining coverage will be used in the best interest of those for which we care. Thank you so much, Paula. What a heartfelt story and experience with Medicare Advantage and this relatively new artificial intelligence adding additional burdens to your provision of care and beneficiaries access to necessary care. We thank you both so much. Thank you, Eric, for helping Paula appeal these denials. Thank you, Paula. Thank and now you. we'll move on to our next panel. And I'll introduce David Lipschitz, who is the senior attorney at the Center for Medicare Advocacy in our policy division. In fact, he's our senior policy uh, attorney and associate director. And he will introduce his esteemed um, partners in conversation, Mina Seshimani and Sean Kavanaugh. David? Thank you, Judy. We are very fortunate to have with us today two leaders, both literally and figuratively in the Medicare world, the current and former director of the Medicare program. Their full and rather impressive bios are available in the program, but I'll give them a brief introduction right now. Dr. Mina Seishamani, MD, PhD, is the director at the Center for Medicare, at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. Her diverse background as a healthcare executive, health economist, physician, and health policy expert has given her a unique perspective on how health policy impacts the real lives of patients. She most recently served as vice president of clinical care transformation at MedStar Health and also provided care for patients as an assistant professor at Georgetown University School of Medicine. Dr. Seishamani brings decades of policy experience uh, to her role, including serving uh, on the leadership of the Biden-Harris Transition HHS Agency Review Team and uh, previous office or previous work at, as a director of the Office of Health Reform at the Department of Health and Human Services. Sean Kavanaugh is the Chief Administrative and Performance Officer of Alidaid, a startup aimed at helping primary care doctors form accountable care organizations, or ACOs. Uh, from 2014 to 2017, he was the Deputy Administrator and Director of the Center of Medicare, the role that Mina now has at CMS. Before assuming that role, Sean uh, worked as the Deputy Director of Programs and Policy at CMS at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, CMMI, as well as other roles uh, in the healthcare world. We are also lucky uh, to have Sean serve on the Board of Directors here at the Center for Medicare Advocacy. They have both graciously allowed me to call them Mina and Sean. So Mina and Sean, thank you and welcome today. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. And in order to, to briefly frame our conversation, uh, I'd like to note that as a beneficiary advocacy organization, we have been both an ally and an adversary of CMS, depending upon the issue at hand. We have both promoted the work of the agency and challenged it. And for example, Sean, during your tenure in the Obama administration, we gave full-throated endorsement of the Affordable Care Act and support of the ACA, but we also filed impact litigation to try to address ongoing uh, issues relating to access to care. However, we recognize that from where the Medicare director sits, the view is very different. 
Disparate voices and interests vie for attention and must be considered. The director deals not only with beneficiaries, but providers, suppliers, contractors, Congress, and others. So during the course of our discussion today, I am hoping that we can touch on both process and substance. And by process, I mean part of what goes into the role of the Medicare director. And as far as substance, I mean, of course, some of the substantive issues that are currently confronting the Medicare program. So let's start with process uh, and the role of the Medicare director. Can you both uh, take turns, if, if you're willing, to talk about some of the things that the Medicare director must navigate? What is within the realm of what the Medicare director can and can't do? How do you see that role? Um, shall we start with Mina, please? Sure. I mean, and again, thank you for having me. And it's great to be here. And it is great to work with you as well. Um, I think in answering the question, the the a framing is what what is the framework in which you try to navigate everything, right? Because as you said, there are many pieces to the very complex healthcare puzzle. And I think one of the things that has been so critical for me, not just in this role, but in prior roles is what's that true north, right? What are we doing all of this for and having that help guide us? So, you know, thinking about for us, you know, the future of the Medicare program, we want to make sure that we are advancing health equity, that we are expanding access to coverage and care. We are driving innovation for whole person care, you know, that's driving high quality and that we're promoting uh, stewardship of the program, you know, affordability and sustainability of the program. And so that really is what serves as the motivator and the lens within which we evaluate where there are gaps, where there are opportunities for improvement and how we can move forward. And so then with that, it comes to, you know, what you were asking, I think there are various pieces to the puzzle, right? The healthcare ecosystem is extraordinarily complex, as you mentioned, where you have providers, you know, people with Medicare, supply chain, you know, the Hill, the White House, right? There are, there are many different players. There's also, you know, again, thanks in part to the pandemic, we've expanded our view of healthcare to include community services, social services, right? And all of the entrepreneurship that happens. And being able, I think it's a strength to be able to have so many interested parties who want to improve the system to that we can really help to to bring them together and, and piece the, the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, you know, more tactically, we have to think about Medicare statute and what is possible, not possible. And then when you do make changes to the program from our administrative levers, what impact can that have on various, as I mentioned, various parts of the ecosystem? Again, we really are thinking about equity as one of the key pieces of this thinking about how an impact occurs geographically, how it impacts innovation, how it can drive settings of care, right? I mean, I think there are many aspects to the work that we do that we are constantly trying to evaluate as we think about, you know, what is possible. And, you know, again, on tactics, the other piece I would add is that we have different parts of the Medicare program. There's, you know, fee-for-service Medicare, part A and B, there's Medicare Advantage, there's Part D drugs, and there's Medigap, supplemental insurance. And so we also have to think about how these different pieces interplay, because we want to make sure that we have good options for people and that they can actually navigate them, and that what we're providing overall with the Medicare program provides good care for people. I, I love that Mina started with the high level, what are you trying to accomplish? What's important to you? Because I do think to, to give you an illustration of why that's so important and why I like that Mina started there is part of the job of the director of Medicare is there are roughly 20 some payment systems in Medicare, each of which has to be updated every year through regulation. So it's 20 regulations that need to be cleared by the Medicare director through CMS, through the Department of Health and Human Services, through the White House. And they also all have to go through proposed and final rules. So that's 20 times three times two cycles. You're quickly shepherding and briefing over a hundred times. And so what that's one out of every three days, Mina could be spending her time explaining a Medicare rule to somebody. And if you let yourself get bogged down in that, um, the job could be 
quite boring. And it's not. It's an amazing job. I, we should both acknowledge it's a great job. If anybody out there ever has a chance to do it, I recommend it highly. But what you have to do is exactly what Mina said, which is step back and say, what am I trying to accomplish? Here? What are the high level goals? And then each of those regulations and each of those briefings becomes an opportunity. Um, many of the things we were trying to do when I was at Medicare are very similar to what Mina's describing. I give enormous credit to this administration to really injecting equity into it. But I could see from the outside, you can see as these regulations come through, you keep seeing how Mina and her colleagues are finding what does equity mean in the ESRD rule? What does equity mean in this rule? And so that's how you balance the day-to-day, -day, very quotidian and time-consuming regulatory process and tie it back to your principles and goals. Thank you both. So I'd, I'd like to circle back on, on um, you know, touching on the, the point of equity that both of you made and more broadly speaking with respect to how consumer advocacy organizations like ours can vie for attention amongst all of the noise and the, the fire stream or the fire hose stream of, of things that the Medicare director has to deal with. How, how can groups like ours make the most impact on policy that's being developed there and, and specifically with respect to some of those equity issues in general? Sean, why don't you start this time? Sure. <laughs> <Thanks. Take turns. laughs> I think the strength of the center is what we just heard from prior to me and I coming on, which is the center has you, David, and a policy wing, but that policy comes from day-to-day -day representation of real clients with real problems. And, and that's something people in the Center for Direct, Center for Medicare Director struggle with. We can articulate how we want it to happen and how we wrote the regulation, but you're the ones who know out in that nursing home what happened when NAVA Health, and you'll know NAVA Health doesn't appear in regulation or <laughs> sub-regulatory guidance, but to that poor patient, NAVA Health was Medicare for those instances. So the fact that you can tie very tangible, real effects on beneficiary and make the linkage to policy, I think, is your strategic advantage. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, um, I mentioned kind of our strategic pillars around equity, around whole person care, around sustainability and affordability. But also, you know, all those regulations that, you know, Sean detailed, and thank you, Sean, for reminding me how many briefings <laughs> that we have to do, but you know, that occurs at, you know, say the 30,000 foot level, right? Between where a regulation sits and the programs we implement and when care is provided on the ground to a particular person, there is a lot of partnership, a lot of execution with many different pieces of the healthcare ecosystem that has to occur. And where we are able to get feedback of, here is how things are playing out on the ground. Here's where there's an opportunity for improvement and where we can support either through our regulation or just through facilitation and sharing of best practices and, you know, partnership power as well. I think it's so important, you know, to bring that real world perspective and real world examples so that we can make sure that the program is doing what it's supposed to do, which is serve 63 million people. You know, I said, we have to keep those people that the Medicare program that we want to serve at the center of everything we do. And I say that also having just recently cared for Medicare, you know, beneficiaries as a physician, right? It all comes down to when care is provided on the ground and we can do everything we can to create a system and an environment in which that's possible. But having that continual back and forth is critical so that we can continue to improve and make sure that we're all moving in the same direction. That's much appreciated. And, and, Sean, during your tenure, you know, I have to say not just because you're on uh, on our board and I'm trying to, you know, kiss up, but you were very responsive to us uh, when we reached out uh, to try to identify systemic issues. One of the things that struck me was, was uh, you know, you had said something along the lines of, well, we, we don't hear from, from beneficiary groups enough. You hear plenty from providers, but we don't hear from beneficiary groups enough. And Mina, I have to commend this administration's efforts to engage stakeholders. I, I feel like groups like ours have had a lot more opportunity to, to voice these uh, concerns, raise issues, share stories with us. So I, I wanna you know, thank you for that, that effort uh, of engagement that, that we hadn't seen to this level before. I'm, I'm wondering if, 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 there isn't there, if there isn't anything else with respect to process and, and the role of the Medicare director that you'd like 
for folks to know or understand. Uh, first, I want to stop, see, see if there is anything else about the role before we turn to substance. I mean, I will just say piggybacking off of what you said, David, you know, it is a strategic pillar of CMS to really engage the community, the communities that we serve with our programs and to really have external engagement be front and center for our policymaking process and for our operations. And that's something that I really take to heart. You know, we want to hear from voices that have not always been heard. We want to make sure that we're keeping the people that we serve at the center of what we do. And so we are making a concerted effort to make sure that we are hearing from all aspects of the ecosystem. So it's not just reactive. Okay, if somebody reaches out and wants to have a meeting because they have an idea, it's also who are we not hearing from? Let's go out and talk to them, right? So I'm trying to make visits. Like I went to rural New Mexico and visited the only ACO in the entire state of New Mexico in Northern New Mexico and learned about how they're trying to address issues of tribal care, right? And, you know, an IDD population ACO in New York, right? Trying to really make sure that we are, with 63 million people, there's a huge diversity to who you're serving the needs, and what aspects of the healthcare ecosystem are helping or not help or could be improved. And so that really is a very conscientious effort on my part and on the part of you know, CMS leadership. Right. Yeah, David, you made a good point. I do think it was a learning of mine at CMS that I needed to hear more from stakeholders. And I think, again, the current administration has done a much better job of like putting that front and center from the outset. The only thing I would add is... Um, so the director of the Center for Medicare is a politically appointed position. As I said, 100 and some briefings a year on regula regulations. How do we possibly do it? We do it because there's a career staff and the CMS career staff are fantastic. I, I honestly think sort of the crown jewel of American government. Um, but at the same time, one of their great strengths is many of them have been at the agency for years. They know the history, they know how everything's done. But one of the roles of the Center for Medicare director, being a political point to you, is going to come just for a couple of years, is to have had experience outside the agency. Um, Mina's experiences at MedStar. I worked at a health system in uh, New York. And I do think the bringing together of those two cultures makes the Medicare policy better. That's great. That's, that, that's helpful in helping us understand that role. I, I just have one more question I wanted to pose before you know, we get to, to issues, substantive issues, and that during our preliminary conversation, Mina, you'd, you'd made the point that um, there could be good language in the Medicare rules, but you know, it comes down to how that how the rules are implemented and how they are enforced. I'm wondering if you have any further thoughts on on kind of the, the challenges that arise when you have, say, a really good thing, a good rule that, that provides for great things for people, but you have the challenge of actually, you know, putting that into effect and are there ways that that our groups groups like ours can help that happen yeah i mean i think this this comes down to being able to have that dialogue so that you can always see how things are playing out in practice healthcare is very complex and it is very personal and when you bring those two things together it's a challenge but it's also an opportunity so when you have a policy you don't always, you know, you're learning constantly, okay, how, what impact is this going to have? Because there's so many different pieces and interfaces in the healthcare ecosystem. And so being able to have that continual feedback is very important on the policy side. And I would say on the operation side, it is so important. This is not just in healthcare. This is for anything, customer service and getting feedback from customers on how Something is serving them. Is it working? Is it not? I think that's extraordinarily important. As we think about oversight or as we think about just day-to-day -day operations, where are there opportunities for us to improve? This is something that we're always open, open to. And that is something that is part of you know, any industry. Yeah. Um, on this question, I always think back to, well, this happens all the time currently, but it used to happen more, or I noticed it more when I was in the job, which is people often say Medicare should. Medicare should do something. And I always like, hold on a second. Is this statutory? Do you mean Congress should do something? Is it regulatory? Do you mean I should do something through regulation? Or is it out in the field? Is it Navajo Health should not do what we just heard? Um, Navajo Health should consider the circumstance. But again, to the beneficiary, who the reason we're all here, that's all Medicare. 
but it, it, it's and so you you're right to put your finger on this david like medicare is a complex thing that, that both driven by statute regulation but also driven by practices in the field the last thing i'll say and this isn't quite on point but i remember when i was at medicare there was a lot of literature coming out about how medicare patients were being readmitted to hospitals at high rates and then a body of science showing Medicare patients who saw their primary care doctor within five or seven days of being discharged um, had a much lower readmission rate. And we're like, oh, problem solved. We'll create a new code and we'll pay doctors um, to visit, to see their patients, reach out and see their patient and drive down the readmission rate. So we did that and patted ourselves on the back. Two years later, nothing happened. <laughs> no one was using the code. And so I went around and talked to the physician groups. Why aren't you using the code? And they said, we don't know when our patient's been discharged. Like, so it just shows you there are limitations. Like you've got to really think this through and be iterative and follow through on what is the end goal. And there are very powerful tools in Medicare, but there's also a reliance on a lot of actors in the field. Thank you, Sean. Thank you both for that answer. And I, uh, I pledge on the behalf of our organization that when we say sure. Medicare should do something, we will clearly articulate what should be done statutorily, regulatorily, uh, education-wise, and, and every other manner or method we can possibly think of. So turning, turning now to, to substance and recognizing the ongoing challenges of the pandemic, a narrowly divided Congress that could impede this administration from, from effectuating some of its, its goals, I, I want to talk a little bit about the, the challenges and opportunities that you both see uh, in front of the Medicare program now. And I, I want to touch on both Medicare Advantage issues as well as, as CMS's announced goal of having 100% of those who remain in traditional Medicare uh, be, some kind, be part of some kind of accountable care relationship you know, by 2030. Um, so starting, I guess, with, with, with Medicare Advantage, I hope to touch on both kind of payment and, and oversight. And I don't know if you had the chance to, to hear uh, Juliet from the Kaiser Family Foundation speak at the outset uh, of our conference, but among the things she said was that the, the foundation of Medicare is changing. There's, there's a shifting landscape, uh, in part because of the growing uh, enrollment in you know, Medicare Advantage by some projections will have half of all Medicare beneficiaries within the next year or two. And with respect to, to payment issues, Medicare you know, Payment Advisory Commission has highlighted how Medicare Advantage is being paid at a, at a higher rate um, than is spent on comparable traditional Medicare beneficiary, higher per capita spending, and that such spending is rising more rapidly. And, and Secretary Becerra recently made some comments essentially acknowledging that um, it shows that the Medicare program is spending more uh, per Medicare recipient on MA through fee-for-service. Now, Acknowledging that Congress really drives the train when it comes to a lot of these issues, we know that CMS does have some oversight over some of these issues. So when it came to you know, the 2023, I guess, payment year, which is the first time this administration was able to make a stamp on, on some of these payment issues, CMS did not use its available authority to with, within the realm of what can be done with respect to, to payment, um, for example, with the statutory minimum coding adjustment. Um, so that Medicare Advantage spending continues to be at this higher rate, which has, you know, trust fund implications. So, Nina, I was wondering if you can, you can explain CMS's rationale for not using this discretion for the, for the upcoming plan year, for, for 2023, given the pressures of, of Medicare Advantage payment and, and the growing trust fund concerns. Yeah, David, thanks for your question. You know, I think I would, I would say that Medicare Advantage plays an important role in the Medicare program overall, as I mentioned before, right? You have A and B, you have Medicare Advantage, D, and, sub, and um, supplemental insurance. And there are opportunities for us to make sure that we are getting value for the services that are being provided for what the Medicare dollar. And there, there, we have started to make movement in that direction. So for example, in the MA and Part D rule, we are requiring for the first time reporting of medical loss ratio for supplemental benefits so that we can see how the Medicare dollar is being spent on supplemental benefits like food, food support, housing, transportation, dental, hearing, vision. So reinstating the uh, reporting requirements that had been removed and adding to them. 
you know, other things like, are there ways, you know, coming back to what we were talking about before about equity, are there ways that we can really guide and encourage and drive the Medicare Advantage program to make sure that it is serving beneficiaries? So soliciting comment on a health equity index um, to, to see how are these plans serving those most vulnerable, duly eligible, disabled, low income? And, you know, we solicited comment. We're continuing that work. Um, so those are just some examples. I mean, we also reinstated network adequacy and, you know, expanded ability for us to deny applications by poor performance, poor prior performance. So really third party marketing, you know, increasing oversight of third party marketing, requiring multi-language inserts for free translation services. So we definitely in our rulemaking have started to really say, okay, how, Medicare Advantage serves an important role. How do we make sure that it's continuing to serve that role? And we're and working in partnership to try to get more data to understand what's being done. And I think also, you know, we are constantly looking at, you know, risk adjustment, coding patterns, et cetera. And that is also ongoing work that we are exploring. Again, coming back to ultimately what our tenets are, our North Star for Medicare, which is advancing equity, expanding access, driving innovation for whole person care, and making sure that we are good stewards of the program. Thank you, Mina. And Sean, I want to see if you want to weigh in on the, 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 the payment side before circling back to, to oversight. Sure. sure. And uh, I'm going to speak freely because I'm not speaking for Mina. She hasn't told me anything. So if it, if it sounds like I'm bulging secrets, <laughs> she told me she did not. But part of understanding the practicality, the realities of the job um, is understanding timing. Um, so not just Mina, but many of the Biden people who care about Medicare policy, you know, were appointed and came into their jobs at different points last year. Um, so, and then the Medicare rulemaking occurs, um, the Medicare Advantage rulemaking occurs late in the year and then spilling into this year. I personally, as an observer, would expect now that they're in place and have had some time on it, that we'll see more policy making in the next two cycles than you saw in the first cycle, just for pure timing reasons. They're on the job longer, um, that sort of thing. I don't know what they're going to do. Um, that's part of Minnie's job is to make sure those of us on the outside don't know ahead of time. Um, <laughs> um, having said that, I do think, you know, something I grappled with when I was there is the whole notion of Medicare Advantage growth, which in and of itself is not problematic. But I do think, you know, it used to be an option in Medicare and it's increasingly becoming the Medicare program. And I think from a lot of perspectives, we need to think through what are the implications of that. One of them is how do you reconcile the fact that the benchmarks, because of risk coding, provide the plans more money at a time when the program's threatened with, the Part A trust fund is threatened with solvency. Um, an untold part of risk coding, and this is where you get to be, only really health policy nerds care about, is we've literally created a non-productive industry where there are businesses that, that, that collect diagnoses on Medicare Advantage but solely for the purpose of getting paid, not to improve the, pay, the, the the care that these folks receive, but to improve the payment that the plans receive. Um, now, risk is, adjustment is absolutely necessary and using diagnoses makes sense, but this is an unintended consequence where there's no benefit to society and there's enormous sums of money being spent on this. Um, so that's something that's troubled me for a while. Yeah. So thank you, John. So I... I, I um... Hopefully, we will see more in that area, and, and acknowledging we really need Congress to, to intervene as well. But to, to the point, Mina, you were making about um, the, the recent Part C and D rule, I do want to acknowledge that that this administration has reversed course from what was in the previous administration, what we would characterize as a regulatory rollback, and has reinstated some critical oversight. Um, you know, reinstated some rules that were withdrawn. Mm -hmm. And, and have put in, some, in place some important requirements, including around medical loss ratio reporting about new plans entering. But, and also want to acknowledge that, you know, improvements in beneficiary communication took what we saw as really a, a pivot towards the agency um, presenting information about Medicare options in a non-neutral, non-biased uh, manner, and then changing it with revisions to Medicare new, for which, which we are grateful for, you know, back towards a place where the information is more unbiased. 
but I think from 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 where we sit, we really wanted to see more with respect to Medicare advantage and part deregulation because some things were were reimposed, some more rules were reimposed, but there were some network adequacy loosening. Um, there were some marketing rules that were changed. And then, of course, I, I know you're aware of the, the recent Office of Inspector General report concerning Medicare Advantage prior authorization, which showed the, the levels at which plans inappropriately denied services that should have been covered under traditional Medicare. And one, one of the points that that OIG report made was that CMS had not yet acted upon the recommendations from a similar 2018 OIG report on that very topic. So uh, on the point of, of you know, oversight, um, you know, it, it can very well be that the, the point that Sean was making that it, you know, it takes time for this stuff to, to, to develop, to, for people to get into place and for that to happen. But I was wondering if you, if you could talk about what we might see on the horizon with respect to additional oversight, given the fact that more, people are enrolling in Medicare Advantage, given the, the fact that, you know, it is taking up more of the Medicare program's budget. And given the fact that we have seen all these issues with respect to prior authorization and denials of care, including, you know, the, the what we just heard from, from Eric and Paula just before this session. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, what I didn't mention in the, you know, previously was that we did have a common solicitation on prior authorization as well, because that has, come up and so we wanted to get more information about that. And I think overall, our goal is to make sure that the Medicare program is working for the people that it serves. And where there are levers for us to make sure that the different aspects of the program are advancing equity, are providing high quality care, and are making sure that we can keep the be good fiscal stewards of the program, that is absolutely where we're going to focus. And so you saw some of that in the prior rounds of rulemaking, and those are themes that will continue. That's how we look at Medicare Advantage. That's how we're looking at the fee-for-service side as well when we're thinking about payment accuracy, et cetera. And so all the things that we're talking about where, where there are opportunities to have more transparency, have more data, and be able to make sure that the Medicare dollar is being spent in the most effective way possible to serve our beneficiaries. That is exactly what we are um, we are focused on. Thank you. So we're in our remaining uh, couple minutes of time. Want to briefly touch on on kind of the rest of the Medicare population. You know, we we know that Medicare Advantage is is taking more and more population growth, and as, as Juliet from Kaiser Family Foundation kind of outlined this morning. That means a smaller, you know, uh, traditional Medicare population um, that could be more sick. So we, we know that that the administration has announced the goal of, of having folks, you know, the remaining folks in traditional Medicare in some type of accountable care relationship. And, and Sean here, you know, your, your um, insight currently working for ACOs, you know, can, can really help illuminate things here. But I, I, will, I, I will just pose a question this way and then, then you know, uh, um, ask you to, to respond. To, it seems that that more of this movement towards accountable care is focusing on on capitated payment, you know, per member per month. What, so if, if if that is the direction, and, and please correct me if if that is an inappropriate characterization, but if that is kind of the direction of where we're going with accountable care, what would you say to those who are skeptical that uh, we have not yet addressed all of the negative incentives that come from capitated payment? And on the part of providers, and that you know could include withholding care or or stinting on care. What can you say to reassure us that um, you know these that we we've done enough to fix the system so that that's not something we have to worry about as we shift towards accountable care? I guess, John, I might I'll start with you. Sure. Um, so as you said, like this is <laughs> there's really nothing new in healthcare. There's just revisiting old ideas and seeing if you can do them better. So as you said, back in the 90s, there was an error of capitation that did not go well. Um, and it didn't go well for two in two ways. One, health plans that were fully capitated used very strict gatekeeper models um, that were not popular with consumers, and there was a backlash against that. And two, some provider groups took on significant financial risk and then didn't prosper and, and actually went out of business. And there was 
you know, which was very disruptive to the health system to have large physician groups, multi-specialty practices, you know, going bankrupt. So what's different this time? I think the most important thing that is different is our ability to balance the efficiency side of spending money frugally and efficiently with making sure we have good outcomes. Now, that's not to say we have perfect quality measurement, but I do think we're keeping track of the beneficiary experience and beneficiary outcomes much more closely in these arrangements than we did in the 90s. Having said that, I think we need to make further advancement in patient reported outcomes to really hear from the beneficiaries themselves. And I know there's a lot of work going on in this area. I'm not a quality measurement specialist, but it always seems frustratingly slow. The other thing you get you put your finger on is accountable care relationships imply that someone is taking responsibility. And in a payment system, that responsibility usually involves some sort of financial risk, whether it's capitation or shared savings. I think we have a lot to learn about how much risk is necessary to get better care. Um, people often, there's a sort of an, an assumption in the field that two-sided risk, capitation, whatever you want to call it, higher levels of risk are better. I don't think there's a good body of evidence that supports that. I think some levels of risk, certainly, you know, certainly there've been physician groups in the Medicare shared savings program that have only had upside risk and have improved care and saved money for Medicare. So I think there's a lot more for us to learn. And I, and I share your concern. I don't think there should be a mad rush to full capitation, um, not just because of the wariness around stinting on care, but of the wariness of whether that's too much risk particularly for physician groups who have demonstrated the best ability in ACOs to date to improve care. Thank you. Mina, we will leave you with the last word. Anything you want to well, comment in say, response? I mean, I would say overall, actually, coming back to how you started, David, about the power of bringing different stakeholders all together who are involved in the ecosystem and where... The, the, the power of, you know, organizations like Center for Medicare Advocacy to make sure that the lived experiences of people with Medicare are part and parcel for the conversations that happen as we're all trying to drive towards, you know, good fiscal stewardship and equity and innovation in a way that really improves care. You know, I just can't emphasize that enough. And so as we're moving forward, right, the conversations we had on MA on, you know, from the payment um, things that we're exploring to the oversight things that, we, that we're exploring, like this is where to, you know, what we were just talking about with the move to, you know, holistic care models, being able to hear like, where are the opportunities, where are the concerns, what are the things that we need to make sure we're addressing, where are the levers that we have in the Medicare program versus what is statutory versus what is we can encourage things on the ground, but some of it also comes to how things play out on the ground and we can try to facilitate partnerships, et cetera. I think that's all a critical conversation for us to make sure that we're all you know, putting our shoulder to the wheel to drive towards these shared goals. Mina, thank you for all the work that you're doing now. And thank you for our, our ongoing conversations. Sean, thank you for all the work you have done in, in the past and, and your current work. Um, including continuing to serve on our board. Thank you both so much for your time and your insights today. We would love to continue the conversation in, in other uh, fora and events. Thank you both. I'll turn it back now to uh, Matt or Judy, one of them. Yeah, thank you so much. We really appreciate um, your outreach, uh, Dr. Seshimani. You've been really remarkable in that regard. And um, Sean, you, you really listened when you were Medicare director, and that's the first place to start. Your hearts and ears are open. We appreciate that very much, and we'll help find the way. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, David. So now we'll hear um, another uh, story, voice of Medicare lived, lived experience. In this case, uh, from Peter Tom Thomas, who's uh, managing partner at Powers Law. Uh, he he mo perhaps most importantly in this particular regard is both a brilliant lawyer and advocate and a human being who has experienced 
with his own um, trauma and difficulty and had that has used that to inform his life and work and advocacy for others. And I want to thank you, Peter, also uh, let it not go without saying that this um, summit is made possible in part by a sponsorship from your law firm, Powers Law, as well as from the Christopher and um, Reeve and Dana Reeve Foundation. So with that, I'll introduce Peter Thomas for his lived experience. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today. Peter? Thank you so much, Judy. I really appreciate your invitation to speak. Uh, it'll be brief, but I, I want to make a few points to underscore the importance of access to care and access to rehabilitation services. I find it particularly appropriate that um, I'm speaking today uh, at this conference on National Trauma Survivors Day. Um, in 1974, I was in a car accident in Canada with my family. <clears throat> my uh, brother uh, was lying right next to me in a station wagon and, and unfortunately died. And I uh, lost both my legs below the knees uh, on impact. Um, after about a week hospital stay up in acute care hospital in New Brunswick, Canada, I was flown out to Denver, Colorado, went to Craig Rehabilitation Hospital. And m many of you may know of Craig. It, it primarily serves patients with uh, brain injuries and spinal cord injuries, uh, mostly adults, almost exclusively adults. But at the time, my uh, my aunt and uncle uh, knew the uh, knew the hospital well, and they were able to get me in. I spent two and a half months at Craig, um, re really recovering and rehabilitating myself. Um, had an incredible care team uh, of professionals, uh, physiatrists, PTs, OTs, prosthetists, and the like, and really experienced firsthand the in inpatient rehabilitation, um, coordinated and intensive care that is so critical to so many Medicare beneficiaries these days uh, after an illness or an injury. I learned how to walk again. I uh, got exposed to the wonderful world of uh, prosthetic care, uh, prosthetic limbs, and ultimately wound up walking into my fifth grade um, uh, classroom uh, upon my return to New York on Long Island. And so that was a two and a half uh, month experience that really changed my life, as you can imagine. Uh, in retrospect, you look back, and I have very fond memories of that time. The pain tends to fade with time, but um, the experience itself was really uh, truly a, a life-changing experience for me. Um, through the years, my father was a public school teacher. He had very good uh, health insurance. I was able to access very good prosthetic care, and I wa witnessed huge improvements in both technology and clinical prosthetic care throughout the years, uh, really was able to do a lot of things that I never really thought I would be able to do, snow ski and play golf and work out and do all kinds of things. I got a job. I went to law school. I raised a family with my wife. Um, and it really all is because of the value of rehabilitation and good quality care. Um, you know, Medicare is a lifeline. We all know a lifeline in terms of medical care, but rehabilitation as well. Um, and it does some incredible things after people experience serious illnesses or injuries. But there are some shortcomings, and we've heard about some of those today already and probably will um, uh, with, the, with respect to the rest of this conference. I mean, Medicare doesn't seem to meet its promise when Medicare Advantage plans use prior authorization, as we just discussed in the last panel, uh, to deny care uh, unnecessarily in many instances to limit costs and to uh, control utilization through prior authorization. Uh, Medicare doesn't meet its promise when it uses proprietary guidelines to um, deny patients access to inpatient rehabilitation hospital care. Uh, it doesn't meet its promise when it second guesses the, you know, uses contractors to second guess the medical judgments and of, of treating physicians. It doesn't meet its promise when it doesn't provide certain benefits dental, um, vision, hearing benefits, uh, or other benefits like low vision aids, which are excluded because of the eyeglasses exclusion, a total bar on low vision aids uh, because of that purpose. And finally, something that we're working on right now uh, that's pending before CMS, a national coverage determination to create coverage for seat elevation and standing systems in power wheelchairs 
something that people with mobility impairments who are non-ambulatory desperately need to be functional in and outside of their home. So there's plenty the, of work to do with respect to Medicare. I, I have been graced with uh, incredible access to good quality care, and it sounds probably corny, but I've spent my bulk of my career trying to just um, try to enable others to get the same kind of access that I've had throughout my life. Um, so thank you so very much. The federal government has a tremendous responsibility for improving and preserving the Medicare program. And I really do appreciate the opportunity to address this group. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Peter. I, I think you're not only a superb advocate and attorney whose uh, work is so important to so many, but I admire so the way you've uh, responded to the trauma in your own life. And I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I did not know until today that it also involved losing your brother. So yeah. uh, your parents and you have uh, been through the ringer. Um, but you've used that to understand, uh, have empathy, and also know how to use your skills to help others get access to health care and therapy and rehabilitation in particular. As some who are attending today, today know, um, Peter has been very helpful in helping the Center for Medicare Advocacy move and try and implement the GMO uh, lawsuit settlement because he certainly understands that uh, there's some improvement and then you backslide and then you go forward and it's human beings are not, uh, don't necessarily improve in a linear fashion or they may need the therapy to maintain or slow decline. So I wanna thank you again for, for helping us with that work and thank your law firm, Powers Law for all it does and for helping to sponsor this moment. Thank you so very, very much, much, Peter. Thank you, Judy, appreciate that. Thank you. And now we will um, take a moment to uh, have a break for a few minutes, and then we'll return to uh, hear the John uh, Senator J. Rockefeller lecture with E.J. Dion, which we're very excited about. And I want to thank um, right now Arnold Ventures, which is our inclusivity um, sponsor for this summit, and which is why so much of the equity focus is possible because of their sponsorship. Thank you. Have a good break. Welcome back, everybody, for this exciting component of the seminar when we have the Senator J. Rockefeller Lecture. This is our ninth annual Senator J. Rockefeller Lecture, named for the esteemed senator who you see before you on your screen. Senator, it's wonderful to see you again and um, hope that you are feeling well, and we're delighted to have you with us today for your lecture. And the Senator gave the lecture the first time, which was only appropriate. We named this lecture to make sure that we continue to advance your legacy as a champion for quality health care, indeed social justice and a quality life for all people. I'm always um, rem I always find it remarkable to read, uh, and I want to remind people that the senator began his public service career as a VISTA. Uh, not everyone still remembers what a VISTA was, but that was when you made about $4,000 a year to serve this country in a low-income uh, community, and the senator began that in West Virginia. And um, I suspect members of your family figure you never really left ended up being, um, after long, very long story short, governor of West Virginia, and elected and re-elected to the Senate from West Virginia in 1990, 96, 2002, and 2008, which is quite remarkable. Um, and we are so grateful for your public service and for your um, joining the Center for Medicare Advocacy as a champion with this lecture naming and continuing your legacy and being given this year by E.J. Dion. Senator, you. do you have some remarks or anything you'd like to say no, at I'm this time? Spare, I'm going to spare you those remarks. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's um, wonderful that we're able to have this lecture sponsored this year by the John A. Hartford Foundation, which is, is providing the Center for Medicare Advocacy with funds that particularly allow this this lecture to happen. And I am grateful 
and as is the center for the John A. Hartford Foundation that allows us to do work in emerging areas that we otherwise would not have funding for. And I am happy to say that this year's lecture is being provided by E.J. Dion. Um, I see you, Mr. Dion, on our camera there. Welcome to the Thank you. ninth annual Voices of Medicare Summit and Senator J. Rockefeller Lecture. I know that you have expressed your great admiration and indeed affection for the Senator. And I hope you've had some opportunity prior to this moment to, to speak together. No, we have. That's good. Everything okay. is neutral. <laughs> <laughs> My yes. Yeah, I, I'm about to say a few things about I the bet, Senator. I as, bet uh, you are. <laughs> well, let me introduce E.J. Dion. He's a se senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, a syndicated columnist, I'm sure many of you know, for the Washington Post and also a university professor in the Foundations of Do Democracy and Culture program at Georgetown University. I think that has a little something to do with our esteemed chair, board chair, Judy Fader, who was a dean at that program at Georgetown at Public Policy at Georgetown. He's a nationally known and respected commentator on politics, appears regularly on National Public Radio and MSNBC. And as far back as 1975, he also reported for the New York Times. He's written a book, which I suspect he will talk a little bit about today with his um, co-author, Miles Rappaport, who was the secretary of the state here in Connecticut. So that's really quite a remarkable and, and lovely connection as well. I wanna thank you on behalf of the Center for Medicare Advocacy for giving this lecture. I know it takes time and attention, and we're really grateful for the attention to fact and truth and honest reporting and civility that you bring to journalism and bring to this moment. Thank you so much. And now I turn the stage over to you, E.J. Dion, Jr. Well, thank you uh, so much. And actually, Miles and I have been talking about our book so much that it will be a great relief to talk about Medicare Good. Uh, and social policy. But I love Miles, and he's been a great uh, partner. And uh, I'm also, I know many people don't like Zoom, but there is one thing I love about the Zoom era, which is it's the only time in my life uh, when anybody told me to unmute myself. So I'm uh, grateful at least uh, for that. Um, and it is such an honor uh, to be with all of you today for so many reasons. Uh, above all, the commitment of everyone on this call to the moral and practical concerns uh, that Lyndon Johnson lifted up when he signed the bill creating Medicare on July 30th, uh, 1965. Um, he used two wonderful phrases. He said it was about care for the sick and serenity for the fearful. And we should never lose track of those two phrases, which uh, my friend Jonathan Cohn, the great uh, healthcare writer, once described as both simple and elegant in capturing the purpose of a good healthcare system. And I know no one on this call will ever forget uh, those objectives. Uh, there are so many people listening uh, today whom I admire uh, so much, uh, including the Judy who introduced me, uh, but I must mention uh, two of them. Uh, obviously, one of them is Senator Rockefeller. I was invited to give this brief talk today by the senator. And even if I had wanted to, I could not have said no uh, to a public servant uh, whom I admired so much uh, for a career where he was constantly um, seeking solutions to public problems, especially those confronting the left out uh, and the left behind. He was at once practical uh, and visionary. Uh, with the help of my research assistant, Megan Bell, I took a look back just at Senator Rockefeller's work on health care uh, throughout his career. Um, and if I recited all of it, I would run over not only the time I have for this talk, but the whole, the time allocated to this entire conference. But I would just like to tick off with the speed of light a few of his achievements going back to the beginning of his career in the Senate in 1985. Way back then, he introduced bills on behalf of maternal and child care, 
and, in, and improved uh, access to mental health services uh, in rural health clinics. Yes, in 1985. Imagine if we had offered all the care he proposed and that we needed uh, in the mental health sphere when the opioid crisis first hit. He put forward the Long-Term Care Assistance Act, the Rural uh, Health Clinic Improvement Act, the Family Health Insurance Protection Act, which prohibited health plans from denying coverage based on pre-existing conditions. How long did we have to wait for that to happen? That was in 1995. He was a lead supporter of the Children's Health Insurance Program in 1997, the Healthy Kids Act, aimed at curbing tobacco use by kids and offering bonus payments for increasing enrollment of children on Medicaid. He co-sponsored the Immigrant and Children's Health Improvement Act in 1999 and the Paul Wellstone Mental Health Parity Law. And of course, he fought for the public option in Obamacare, which I am convinced we will get someday and which I still think would have made Obama more popular at the outset had it been included. Uh, but Senator Rockefeller also made sure uh, that the Affordable Care Act was enacted to the benefit of tens of millions of Americans. Now, that's just a short pricey. Uh, you can only imagine the pages and pages of what the full list uh, looks like. And all I can say is bless you, Senator Rockefeller, for never, ever forgetting whom you were sent to Washington uh, to serve. I also have to shout out one of my favorite people, Judy Fader, uh, who has spent a lifetime trying to bring care and serenity uh, to those excluded from access to good health care. My knowledge of health care is to Judy's as my basketball skills are to Bill Russell's and Jason Tatum. Yes, I am a Celtics fan. I mourn uh, last night's game. Um, my only comfort is this statement applies to most of us mere mortals, uh, because hardly anybody knows as much as Judy knows. Uh, Judy was also my dean, as Judy, the other Judy mentioned, at what is now the McCork School of Public Policy at Georgetown. Um, I had a choice of where to affiliate when I became a professor, and Judy invited me uh, to be the part of the Georgetown that she ran. And the fact that she asked was the clincher. That's all that had to happen. I wanted to be with her and to learn from someone who takes stewardship responsibilities so seriously. I love you, Judy. I know you will be asking me the same tough questions you so brilliantly teach your students to answer wisely and well. And I am just grateful that Judy is not grading me on my talk uh, today. I, I want to go back to that LBJ Medicare speech uh, in which he pledged to care for the sick and serenity for the, faith, uh, for the fearful. Uh, he, was at, he actually credited Harry Truman with these virtues, arguing that the give him hell president planted the seeds of compassion and duty uh, in calling for universal health care in the late 1940s. Back then, Truman put matters straightforwardly, as was his habit. Millions of our citizens, Truman said, do not now have a full measure of opportunity to achieve and to enjoy good health. Millions do not now have protection or security against the economic effects of sickness. And the time has now arrived for action to help them attain that opportunity and to help them get that protection. But it took another decade and a half uh, for the time of Medicare and Medicaid to arrive. And there's a lesson here. Reformers must have a sense of both urgency uh, and a degree of patience, strategic patience, you might say. Uh, that leads them to stick with the fight and not walk away in frustration. Now, urgency and patience are not virtues that go together very well. But if there is one lesson in the American story, particularly in the story of healthcare, it is that advocates of social change cannot let the often maddening and grinding sluggishness of our governing system force them into premature surrender. You can't win if you don't play, the coaches say, and you can't win in the long run if you don't bounce back from defeats in the short run. One of the great commentaries on democracy was the title of the memoirs of Larry O'Brien, uh, uh, who is best known as a key aide to John F. Kennedy. Uh, he called his book, No Final Victories. I've always loved that because it means that in a democracy, you can always fight another day. The fact that there are no final victories means there are no final defeats. 
And thank God that advocates of universal health coverage have understood that. The idea, after all, was first broached way back in the early 1900s by Theodore Roosevelt. Truman took up the cause, and it won its first crowning achievement, Medicare and Medicaid, under LBJ. Uh, finally, uh, Johnson said in signing the Medicare bill, we, uh, we uh, turned away from denying the miracle of healing to the old and to the poor. No longer, he said, would we refuse the hand of justice to those who have given a lifetime of service and wisdom and labor to the progress of this progressive country? I do like that LBJ described us as a progressive country. Uh, but as Jonathan Cohn, the great chronicler of our healthcare struggles, has noted, uh, we take our time about doing these things. And we know today that the job still isn't done. As Cohn has written, history tells us that first we agree to an obligation, and then we spend some time, maybe a long time, meeting it. Medicare, he notes, grew to cover more and more benefits. Medicaid grew to cover more and more people. The Affordable Care Act was an enormous step forward, and it provides a lesson of its own. Once the American people experience the success of a program that increases their level of security, woe unto those who tried to repeal it. The best thing that ever happened to the Affordable Care Act was the repeal effort during the Trump presidency, because it brought home the truth offered us by the great folk singer whom I have come to see as a great political philosopher, Joni Mitchell. Uh, she sang, you don't know what you got till it's gone. I think that phrase applies to a lot of what's happened uh, in the last four or five years. Uh, in the case of Medicare, Medicaid, and now the ACA, uh, you don't know what you got until uh, it's threatened. Uh, and that's what happened um, in the uh, uh, repeal uh, effort. Uh, as long as repeal of Obamacare was simply a slogan, what the law actually did was largely obscured behind attitudes toward the messy way in which it was passed, and in some cases, uh, uh, it was uh, affected by attitudes toward the former president. But the Affordable Care Act's core provisions were always broadly popular, uh, particularly its protections for Americans with pre-existing conditions that Senator Rockefeller was pushing for all those years ago, and the big increase in the number of insured that it achieved. The prospect of losing those benefits moved many of the previously indifferent and even many of the hostile to battle against its repeal. Uh, to the surprise of some on both sides uh, of uh, uh, the argument, um, the, the debate brought home the popularity of Medicaid, which in some ways for the first time uh, received the broad public defense usually reserved for Medicare and Social Security. The big cuts Republicans proposed to the program paradoxically highlighted how it assisted so many in so many corners of our population. The popular mobilization against repeal mattered too, uh, with uh, Republican senators discovering opposition to their party's ideas in surprising places. Pro-ACA activists drove two wedges into their coalition. One was between ideologues on the one side and more pragmatic conservatives and moderates on the other. The latter knew the benefits of the program to their states, their hospital systems, and their own constituents. The other divide was within Donald Trump's coalition itself, a large share of which truly believed his 2016 pledge that he'd make the system better. They were horrified to learn that they would be much worse off under the GOP's repeal proposal. We mourn the spread of disinformation, and we should. But citizens of our, in our great Republican democracy are actually pretty shrewd when they are weighing what will directly help them or hurt them. They learn the truth about the Affordable Care Act as they always knew the truth about Medicare and the ACA is still with us. Now we still have a lot of work to do. As the Center for American Progress noted, 12 states have yet to expand Medicaid under the ACA leaving millions of people whose incomes are below federal policy uh, poverty level uh, without access either to Medicaid or uh, to coverage or financial assistance in the uh, federal uh, marketplace. Um, we need a federal Medicare expansion 
that would help uh, more than 3 million people in those states gain health care coverage. Uh, we need better benefits under uh, the ACA. Uh, and uh, we should allow uh, low income residents, uh, low in income residents already covered through private plans to reduce their health costs by switching to Medicaid. The battle to save and improve Medicare uh, is more complicated, as everyone on this call knows better than I. Uh, support for the program is so overwhelming that politicians who would like to undermine it have learned that they must proceed indirectly and by stealth. Cuts here, revisions there, uh, often defended in the name of fiscal responsibility. And never mind that the reductions in expenditures are often designed to pay for tax cuts. Preserving the program's support for the least advantaged and the sickest among the elderly and those who face the greatest health challenges should always be front and center uh, in the national discussion as it is in the discussions you have and that you've had today. Uh, you spent an entire day discussing these issues, and I will not pretend for an instant to try to teach those who teach me. Uh, but it is worth noting uh, a problem that you are on top of, uh, the ways in which, as the New York Times put it last month, tens of thousands of people enrolled in uh, private Medicare Advantage plans are designed ne uh, necessary care that should be covered under the program. It is precisely the kind of issue that can easily escape public attention unless defenders of Medicare bring it to light. You know that, and it's why you do the work you do. I know the role of Medicare Advantage divides uh, recipients of Medicare. Uh, many deeply value it. Others worry that it leaves only the sickest people in the regular Medicare system. Some people may even have feelings in both directions uh, at once. Um, on the one hand, you could look at the Medicare Advantage debate as what a friend of mine called many years ago in another context, a high class problem. At least we are acknowledging the need to provide health coverage to all seniors and are debating the best way to do that. We still have not made the full commitment to do that for everyone else. On the other hand, we do need to make sure that we do not undermine the broader Medicare system. That again is a question that everyone on this call rightly brings to the fore and bless you all uh, for doing it. And in doing that work, you are uh, mindful of the larger battle before us. Uh, the imperative of defending the idea of social insurance. It's a phrase I like to use as often as I can because I don't think we use it enough and I don't think we appreciate enough what the achievements of social uh, insurance uh, represent. Uh, we don't talk often enough. We talk a lot about particular programs, Medicare, Social Security, and the ACA, but we don't look at the broader ground in which they're embedded and the, the commitment to each other that they uh, embody. Uh, as Mike Conjal of the Roosevelt Institute has insisted, a just society demands an energetic government response to the four horsemen of accident, illness, old age, and joblessness. Social insurance is rooted in the simple and most basic idea that there but for the grace of God go I. It is one of the most socially constructive axioms uh, that humankind has invented. Uh, social insurance reflects an awareness that a wealthy market economy can go off the rails and leave individuals and groups behind. Even the most successful can fall on hard times and social insurance reflects a commitment we make to each other. That when I'm down, those doing well will help lift me back up. And when I'm up, I will help to lift up those who are down. And we do these things through government. Because in many areas, and Lord knows, especially in healthcare, government is the only institution with the resources to get the job done. Now, I say these things as someone who's done a lot of work over the years on the voluntary sector, and in particular, the work of faith-based institutions. I disagreed with former President George W. Bush on a great many things, but I shared his appreciation for those he called the armies of compassion, the people in the churches and the synagogues and the mosques and the soup kitchens and the homeless shelters who reach out to the neediest among us. But we cannot pretend, again, especially when it comes to health care, that the voluntary sector will ever on its own be able to muster the resources required 
to prevent hardship and suffering. And actually, I don't think anyone understands that better than the people who work in those sectors and in those voluntary programs. And in fact, government programs strengthen rather than weaken the institutions of civil society. As Kanjal noted, they enable private charity to respond with targeted and nimble aid for individuals and communities rather than shouldering the huge cumbersome burden of alleviating the income insecurities of a modern age. Many of our social insurance and welfare programs arose precisely because private charity failed during the Great Depression. It is no criticism of the good work uh, to note that charities run into trouble when help is most needed. Uh, this happened at many times in our history during the Great Recession. For example, charitable giving fell by 7% in 2008 and 6.2% in 2009, even as local governments and state governments were also cutting back. And most charitable giving, we should note, isn't directed uh, to our least fortunate, only a third, according to the Indiana University Center for, for uh, Center. Uh, for philanthropy, only a third of charitable giving actually goes to the poor. National initiatives for economic security, including health security, fill the gaps and keep the economy going when times get tough and incomes lag. Now, I think one of the value of people like you, advocates of social insurance, is that you're realists about our economic system. You understand that even the best functioning market system has its ups and downs. You understand that many fall into situations of need, not because of their moral failings or weaknesses, but because even the best economic systems can fail and create their own forms of injustice. FDR understood that when he spoke uh, 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 upon signing the Social Security uh, Act. Uh, we can never ensure 100% of the population against 100% of the hazards and vicissitudes of life, Roosevelt declared but we have tried to frame a law which will give some measure of protection to the average citizen and to his family against the loss of a job and against poverty-stricken old age. We wish FDR had included health insurance in his New Deal. It took us time, but we eventually got there. The reason I was so honored to be asked to speak to this group today, beyond my deep respect for Senator Rockefeller and the two Judys on this call, um, is because I honor what you do. You see problems and try to solve them. You understand, contrary to Ronald Reagan's uh, favorite line, that when someone in a Medicare or Medicaid or social insurance, a social security office says, I'm from the federal government and I'm here to help you, that statement is not a joke, as Ronald Reagan suggested. It's the truth. You also understand that no program, no matter how worthy or well-intentioned, is ever perfect because perfection is something that usually eludes human beings and it certainly eludes the one talking to you today. All programs can use revision and updating and reform. Many programs, notably those of the New Deal, began by leaving a lot of people out. In the case of the New Deal programs, many were scarred by the racism of segregationist committee chairs from the South. But over time, Social Security, for example, uh, uh, which initially excluded many jobs held by African-Americans, was expanded and improved to cover them. Medicare is, as John Cohn said, better today than it was when it started, and it can be, as you have been discussing all day, be further improved and become better still. The same is true of Obamacare. I think there's another benefit uh, to making the case for social insurance broadly as you seek to defend the Medicare program. Making that case, I think, is a way out of the trap of generational politics. The fact that our current programs do not do enough for the young should not be as an, uh, used as an excuse to walk away from our commitments to those who are older. I mourn that Congress has, for now it seems, put aside efforts to expand child care, to extend the child tax credit, which when it was all too briefly uh, enforced, cut poverty by 40% among children. I mourn that it is not sought to build on pre-K programs and to help more young people have access to college and both post-secondary training. But if politics turns into a war between generations, 
all generations lose. If instead we look at well-being across the generations, everyone can win. Parents and grandparents care about children and grandchildren. Children and grandchildren care about their parents and grandparents. We need public policies and social insurance programs that reflect this, our best selves, the selves that reach out to those in trouble, to those inside our families and out, to those not like us, and to those whom we love and revere and respect. In his last speech of the 1940 campaign, Roosevelt declared that, quotes, all we have known of the glories of democracy, its freedom, its efficiency as a mode of living, its ability to meet the aspirations of the common man, all these are merely an introduction to the greater story of a more glorious future. We Americans today, all of us, are characters in the living book of democracy, but we are also its author, Roosevelt concluded. It falls upon us now to say whether the chapters that are to come will tell a story of retreat or a story of continued advance. If we are to defend democracy at an hour of peril comparable to the challenge it faced in Roosevelt's time, we have an obligation to stand up for it on principle, to oppose those who would peddle ideas like replacement theory that ignore the best part of the American story, which is the struggle to include all of us in the Constitution's first words, we the people. We have made progress, enormous progress since our founding. We have had periods of retreat, but we have always come back to the, from those retreats to move forward again. We must do that now. But democracy will also be judged by its works, by how it serves to keep us all prosperous, all of us healthy, all of us in a position to seek our goals and pursue our dreams. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, Abraham Lincoln said in the middle of the Civil War, and we must rise to the occasion. You are rising to the occasion first by defending the social achievements of earlier generations, and that is a battle that must continue. But all of us must rise to the occasion in another way as well, by thinking and acting anew, as Lincoln also told us to do at that time to extend those achievements to the next generation, to reform and rethink our past efforts to make them durable, and in so doing, prove that democracy, through its emphasis on self-criticism, self-correction, and self-improvement, is the best path to a free society, and also the best path to a society that can call itself good. Thank you so much. What a beautiful, deeply soulful set of remarks, and at a time we needed it so badly. Thank you so much, EJ. Oh, a, thank uh, you so I, very much. Oh, I, I was. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me a chance to do this, and also to think about these issues uh, some more because it was a it was an inspiration to me to be here. Thank so, you. Thank you, and you know. Um, um, people here at the Center for Medicare Advocacy will know that it's not that infrequent that we hear a story, something's happened to someone we're trying to help, and I think and say, what does whoever is doing that not get about there for the grace of God go I? And I think that that is such a way of summing up all of your remarks and 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 also what, what social insurance means and can mean and what democracy can mean. So um, I just loved hearing that from you. Well, um, thank you. Judy? So I have the honor of asking you the first question, EJ, and I, I'm troubled only because I still hear bands playing behind your remarks. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bless you. Thank you. So, so think of us as cheering. Happy days are here again, baby. <laughs> oh, amen to that. Amen to that. Amen to that. So we, you, you always speak eloquently about the value of social insurance, as Judy was just reinforcing. And I'm going to go back to an aspect of your remarks that I'd like for you to help think through with us. 
you said that Medicare is so popular that its critics attack it by stealth. And one of the stealth mechanisms that has been most effective, which we have paid some attention to today, is the favoring of Medicare Advantage plans in the Medicare program. I would posit to, in, as a, initiated in order to privatize the system. And I think you know that private plans um, now cover about 40% and are projected to get to half of the Medicare population in the not too distant future. And even in your remarks, you allowed us how there can be debate about what is the right way to do things. Mm, I prefer to see it as an, um, or I believe one can make the case that the private, um, the argument that the private sector can somehow do this better is intentionally undermining the public system. And yet we have a real challenge because of the favoring of those plans in the payment mechanisms um, and their ability to attract particularly healthy young beneficiaries with extra benefits, uh, we have a, a problem, a challenge in making our case that social insurance, not private insurance, is the way we need to operate. I wonder if you have thoughts um, other than what you've already powerfully expressed as to how we might make that case. Right. You know, it's funny, Judy, when I was writing those sentences, especially the one where I noted there are some people, there are many seniors who like Medicare Advantage, I heard the voice of Judy Fader in the back of my head, <laughs> honest and true. Uh, and I knew you might ask me a question like that. Uh, so let me say a couple of things. Um, over the years, I have supported various efforts written about um, in my column, various efforts to prevent Medicare Advantage uh, plans from um, undermining the core uh, promise of Medicare. Because I share your worry that you can structure Medicare Advantage in a way that it attracts all of the healthiest uh, seniors. Uh, you know, to exaggerate, it, it attracts the vast majority of the healthiest seniors, leaves Medicare taking care of the least healthy seniors and underfunded in the process uh, if the funding is not balanced uh, right. And so I do think it is, and that's what I thought I was saying when I talked about how people, you and people involved in this group, why you worry about Medicare um, Advantage. Um, and so, yes, I think that fight must be fought, and it's devilishly hard to fight because so many seniors who actually are in the category that can benefit from Medicare Advantage actually like the plans uh, they have. And for many people, it, they provide a transition out of their old private insurance into new private insurance. Later on, they might join Medicare, but that kind of describes the problem you have. Um, I guess if um, the... Um, uh, opponents of Medicare attack it by stealth. I think critics of um, the Medicare Advantage program are going to have to do it gradually, do it, do make changes gradually. And so I think if you assert the core principle that Medicare Advantage plans first have to cover what they promise, which is why I cited that recent study that the New York Times wrote about, I, I thought that was one of the most important set of questions that have been posed to Medicare Advantage plans in a while. And I think that the debate that is going to begin will be very useful to a conversation about Medicare Advantage overall. Um, and so that you know, the rule should be uh, to the extent that these are overfunded relative to the other program, the, the, the real, you know, the Medicare program itself, these imbalances have to be righted. I have to say, as a matter of general principle, I have never uh, felt that health insurance needed to be provided uniformly by government, you know, in the whole debate over Medicare for all. I am struck that there are very generous, um, good systems of social insurance in places like Germany or the Netherlands or Australia that have managed to combine some public and private together, but in ways that are genuinely egalitarian and that provide uh, real help. Um, and so, I, it's, I, I, I have no objection in principle to Medicare for all, but I think our natural path as a country, Atul Gawande, as you know, wrote a piece 
many years ago that said every culture has its own natural path to health insurance. And the Brits ended up with the their national health system because uh, Judy is walking out on me now. Uh, I didn't say back. the right thing about I'm, Medicare I'm Advantage. The, I need to um, the, um, <laughs> the, um, the, 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 they, they started the, their national health program because so many people were moved out of the cities during the blitz that the government just had to set up a system and that became the seeds of their system. I think our path will inevitably go through our very complicated private system um, and that the state's role is more likely than not to grow uh, with time. And having that sort of gradual path uh, strikes me as a better way there. But I know there's a huge debate. It divides the left. And I like not to have that argument because I think the first thing we all need to do is agree that everyone should have good, affordable health insurance. And then we should debate everything that comes after. And that's my bias. I appreciate that. Thank you. And Matt, do we have questions from the group? I think we could find some questions. Uh, first, if I may, I'd like to start with a comment. Bill Arnone, National Academy of Social Insurance, Insurance said that he really appreciated your use of the term social insurance. Uh, it is all of us for each of us. Yes. So oh, a little shout you. out to them. Yeah, no, I, I've been making arguments for social insurance for a long time, and there aren't many occasions when I get to pull them out again, and this seems... <laughs> a place to do it <laughs> yes sir yes sir all of us for each of us is uh, all wonderful. of us for each of us is wonderful yeah um we, we also had a comment from uh chris jennings uh, sort of on the heels of judy fader's question uh which is you know we're focusing on ma but some of the reasons that people choose ma are that it's so much less complex and confusing uh rather than changing MA, can we modernize and strengthen the traditional Medicare program, reduce some of its complexity and make it a little more palatable to people? Do we have an amen for that as well? Yeah, amen. I would have no objection to that. And the, um, no, you, you know, the, I used to joke that when Al Gore went about reinventing government, I was one of the only people not on his staff who actually cared about the effort, uh, except those who enjoyed watching him smash uh, ashtrays. Uh, because I think it's progressives have more of an interest in reforming government and making it work better than anyone else in society, because it's our claim that these programs can greatly improve life for people. And so it is our obligation to make them work as well as we can make them work. Uh, and so I appreciate that comment. I, Matt, I have a follow up on that, if I may. Can I? Should, yeah. So. EJ, the, um, I agree with you completely, except that that reform, having lived through some of that, I appreciate it more when I believe it is um, uh, not playing into a view that government is incompetent and, and is, is more message than substance. And, but I would ask you your thoughts in general, particularly after um, the la living, surviving the last administration, whether we are, it doesn't seem to me we are, that is my concern, making any headway in enhancing uh, confidence and trust in government, uh, in which I think I was have been hopeful the Biden administration would be able to do, because I think it's critical, not just to Medicare or health insurance, but to everything we care about. Just on the reinventing government thing for a moment, we, I, I don't want to debate how much was substantive and how much was show, and there was, obviously, uh, there was some of both in there. Um, I think that to the extent that efforts to reform government play into the idea that everything government does is wrong, stupid, and inefficient is dangerous. It doesn't help us uh, because our core assertion is that one of our core assertions is that you need government to achieve certain things that cannot be achieved through any other mechanism uh, we have. So I agree with that. On the other hand, acknowledging popular impatience with government and the fact that it doesn't always work right, I think only enhances your credibility when you're making the case for government. And so it's a tricky deal because you can sort of fall over the side and sound like you're saying everything government does is a mess. It's got to be completely changed as opposed to saying, um, you know, those Social Security checks arrive pretty efficiently uh, to people. I actually recently had a good dealing with them uh, on something, although it took a while for phones to get answered, but that was a pandemic <laughs> problem. Um, you know, so um, 
you know, but saying that I, I think you, you need to figure out how to do both. Uh, and I think it's worth doing both. Um, the, um, uh, uh, in this period, I think it's, it's a real shame that we have not made more progress in this because government helped the entire economy, uh, kept the entire economy from collapsing for two years. Uh, it's extraordinary. Uh, and that these bills were passed, um, you know, I, I've thought about it. In some ways, it's fortunate Republicans were in power because they felt they needed to vote for these bills because they didn't want the economy to collapse on their watch. Uh, and, um, you know, and when you took the aid that was passed during under Trump and then the expansion under Biden, um, we would have been in dreadful shape, and much of the world would have been in dreadful shape. A lot of other democratic countries responded with a very large role for government. Um, after the New Deal, Americans really did have a sense that the government saved the private sector from itself. And I think that's one of the big differences between now uh, and then, uh, that um, you would think that we would sort of get out of the period that, you know, a, a mistrust of the private sector that began with the great collapse of the banks and, uh, and the financial system in 2008. Um, you know, I think you can go all the way back there and ask the question, why didn't this change? So what I think has happened um, is uh, there's a great, uh, my favorite Marxist is Antonio Gramsci, uh, uh, who once, uh, he had, he gave us the great line that we should have uh, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will, which I try to hang on to. Uh, but he also said that we, when we are between one era and another, when we're in a transition period, the phrase he used, he said, many morbid symptoms appear. And I think we're still in that morbid symptoms phase between the collapse of what some have called the neoliberal order, but or just the pure free market, let it rip order, and where we are heading. And I don't think we've made the transition yet. And it surprises me that we haven't. And I guess uh, you probably have to lay some of that to at our feet as uh, progressives, uh, laid at the feet of democratic administrations. We have not succeeded in saying, um, you know, we really have to do things in a fundamentally different way. Curiously, I think it's a sense that that old order collapsed that actually helped, Ronald Re uh, helped uh, Donald Trump win the presidency in 2016, even though his answer was not the answer, uh, Lord knows, uh, I was looking for, I think we should have been looking for. Interesting. Does that make any sense to you? A, a, a great deal, and, and a great deal of food for thought. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Matt, others? Uh, absolutely. Um, but these these are a little. We have time for one more question. Well, I have two related, so maybe okay. let's see how. Put them together then. <laughs> uh, you'll see in a second. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, guest, and I wish I had a name, says, I uh, thank you for your remarks opposing generational warfare and supporting social insur insurance. Those pushing the former and opposing the latter take the approach that spending seems to be a zero sum game. That is, if the seniors win, Children have to lose. How can we defeat this dangerous false argument? Um, by doing both. Um, you know, I am really, you know, the whatever you thought of Build Back Better, um, a lot of that, and maybe it should have been called uh, strengthening American families and helping children, because a lot of what Build Back Better was about were programs directed to children and, and also especially, though not exclusively, working women. Um, and the child tax credit, um, the death of the child tax credit is to me the biggest social policy shame of this period because it did enormous good in an extremely efficient uh, way. I think expanding uh, child care, um, uh, child care availability of pre-K and that sort of thing um, is another area where spending is very popular uh, and most people support these things just as they support care for the elderly. Um, you know, what it requires is somebody to make a case uh, for raising taxes. We have, I mean, politicians always say raising revenue, um, but that means taxes. Now, progressive taxes are also popular. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you, there were proposals to raise revenue to support these uh, that I think certainly wouldn't have tanked the economy, and I think would have uh, were winning public support. 
Um, but I just think we have to assert that, you know, it's never been true. You know, when, when we did the New Deal, we just didn't just pass Social Security. We had the WPA. We had all, you know, we passed Social Security itself, which includes Social Security survivors benefits for, uh, you know, in most cases, it was mothers and children. Um, so we can do it again. I, I just think we have to say that people who are saying that are people who have an artificially uh, have have decided to place artificial limits on the size of the state and are probably people who want to shrink the size of the state, uh, not really for reasons of liberty, although that's what they'd say, um, but for reasons of ideology because they oppose uh, state benefits. Um, so I, I think we just have to do it and let our doing of it be the proof that we can do it. Thank you. Uh, and the related question, and maybe you were getting to this a little bit when you brought up the T word, uh, is this uh, a war between generations that we're really looking at, or is it haves versus have nots? Is it capitalism that is bogging down democracy? I got mine and I'm keeping it. You know, it's really interesting. Robert Dahl, the great, great political scientist, did a book on democracy uh, where, and I, I, I'm trying to remember precisely what the two chapters were. They were back to back, but it was essentially why the free market or capitalism is good for democracy, followed by a chapter of why the free market is bad for democracy. And I really love the two together because in the first chapter, pro-market, he basically made the argument that if all the means of production and everything else is in the hands of the state, um, then all the means of independent thought, independent uh, thinking are in the hands of government, which leaves no ground uh, for um, supporting you know, political parties opposed to those in power and so on. Um, and broadly speaking, uh, you know, it's why I'm more a social democrat than a, a you know, than a full on, you know, um, I don't know what, what I, I'll, I'll leave aside non-democratic socialist. Um, is because I do believe that the two-sector view of society is right and that you don't want the state to have the means to all your ends. I think that somebody like Hayek uh, said that. I don't agree with Hayek on much of anything, but I do agree that you don't want the state to have the means to all your ends. On the other hand, in his other chapter, um, he did talk about how concentrated economic power uh, is the enemy, can be the enemy of democracy. And I think in our country, that danger is far more the one we have to think about now than uh, the problem of a state having the means to all our ends. Um, and when the Supreme Court has decisions like Citizens United or the one just the other day, um, where uh, when you're paying off your campaign debt, you can raise money from private donors, if that doesn't come awfully close to bribery, as you know, Justice Kagan said in her dissent, I don't know what does. Um, and yes, the wealthy will have more power. And democracy works when, as John Kenneth Galbraith said, we think about it as a system of countervailing power. Uh, and the state needs to be uh, constrained enough that all of us have freedom from certain restrictions, but it needs to be strong enough to counteract those forms of private power that get in the way of democracy and can get in the way of our own freedom. And that is our struggle. And so I implicitly agree with the questioner, especially for now, um, with that little piece of Robert Dahl in the back of my head that says, I think we do need to leave. We, we, I think most of us instinctively actually do want to, uh, even no matter how mad we get at capitalism, we want to leave some room for uh, private action. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for letting me uh, throw an extra question. In. I appreciate Absolutely. that. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to the uh, to the uh, audience and the questions so so well put. Um, and and you can tell that we were engaged, EJ. Um, yeah, no, I so why. appreciate that. That's so wonderful. Take the show uh, on the road, EJ. I'm yes. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I so, have my responsibilities to the McCourt School and to you, so I got to <laughs> make sure I meet those responsibilities. Here, here. I still those have a last few, papers, few comments. <laughs> those last few comments reminded me of a New Yorker cartoon, in which the dog, one dog, is saying to the other dog, "It's not enough that dogs win; cats must also lose." I um, love that cartoon. And, <laughs> and I think that sums up um, a big problem with how. 
too many of us are seeing the world these days, whereas you brought a fuller heart and a very full intellect to the notion that um, maybe we can all win if we all work at that. So I, I want to thank you again. And in recognition of your important contribution to journalism, and as we saw today, honest political analysis and civil discourse, um, we are so grateful to have honored, been able to honor you as the senator wanted to with the Senator J. Rockefeller lecture. And that is because of your work as a writer, commentator, professor, and thought leader that's added to the country's knowledge and understanding of the nuances that affect us all in the issues and rights that affect us all. So thank you could, so very much. Could I say thank you? And I just want to say one thing about Senator Rockefeller before please, I gave this talk. Please. I went through um, a lot of material, including some of the things I wrote about him uh, back in the day. And I ran across the story I wrote when he decided not to run for president. And I ended up writing that story. And I remember I was sad when I wrote that story. Uh, and when I reread it, I was still sad. And But he, he never ran for president. But boy, did he make enormous contributions. And as I said, he really remembered the people who sent him here. And uh, that is something to be very proud of. So exactly. I'm honored. I was very honored to do this. Thank you. Thank you. And we are honored as well and honored to have Senator Rockefeller champion involvement in the Center for Medicare Advocacy. With that, we say thank you. Thank you. And don't be a stranger. We'll keep in touch. I hope so. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Deal. Thank you. Now it's my esteemed pleasure to move to the Alfred J. Chiplin Jr. Award component of this wonderful sum summit. We have everybody we should have here. I believe so. I think many in the audience know that we annually, and this is the ninth year, give an award in the name and to continue the legacy of our dear Chip, Alfred J. Chiplin, who was a beloved and admired leader in the elder law, disability rights, healthcare rights, and human rights, and spiritual world of the United States. How we love Chip. There was something about his smile and about his civility and about just his presence that made so many of us better people, happier people. And he also brought a song to this world and poetry to this world. And he brought civility to this world as he fought for justice tirelessly for systemic change in a way that he knew to treat everyone as, an, as a human being. And every human being he recognized had a spark of God within. When he wrote, he wrote poetry. When he sang, he sang his poetry. And one of his last poems was called Embrace and Dream. When you consider the sky, Chip wrote, reach with all you have. Give of your best and taste your dreams. It's my honor this year and the Center for Medicare Advocacy's honor this year to award the Alfred J. Chiplin Award for Civil Society and Advocacy to Wei Wei Kwok, the senior attorney at the Center for Medicare Advocacy. And Wei, I'm really sorry, but Ben Belton was to give these remarks that I'm about to give as the inaugural recipient of the CHIP Award. But Ben is now very involved, aren't we fortunate, in the Biden administration. It's been called, called away, but he sent me his remarks, and I'm going to read them now. Good afternoon, my friends. And I can hear Ben saying that. 
I'm humbled and honored to present the 2022 Alfred J. Chiplin Jr. Social Justice and Advocacy Award to the center's very own Weiwei Kwok. The award honors individuals who work to advance civility and society and social justice for all. The award's namesake, Alfred Chiplin, or Chip as we knew him, Uncle Junior as his nieces knew him, reflects these qualities in abundance. When I think of Chip, says Ben, I remember the words of Dr. King, that everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Chip found greatness in a life given to service and his legacy being as great as the man himself is one of service. Chip's work continues through the hands and hearts of people like Weiwei. Being an Ivy League educated lawyer, she could have followed a more lucrative path. Instead, she found greatness in a career of service and how lucky for us at the Center for Medicare Advocacy. Her service to others spans generations. She has worked to provide supports for LBTBQ plus youth as a board member for the Baird Rustin Center for Social Justice, and of course at the Center for, Set Center for Medicare Advocacy, where she provides legal assistance to Medicare beneficiaries, particularly those in need of home care, nursing home coverage, hospice care, and an understanding of what the law really, really means and promises. Weiwei, thank you for being a voice for the voiceless. Thank you for walking the talk. Thank you for being the change you would like to see in our great community. Thank you for making good trouble, as John Lewis would say. I, that is Ben, join your friends at the Center for Medicare Advocacy and the family of our dearly remembered Chip in presenting you with this award, my friend. Congratulations. And I'll read you the award that you'll be receiving way. And I do want you to know that I, I had the um, pleasure of speaking to Lucille Johnson, Chip, one, of, one of Chip's sister, who said that she was delighted and that she could see Chip's smile beaming when he heard, as she put it, that you were receiving this award. Awarded to an individual who works to advance civility in society and social justice for all. This year to Weiwei Kwok, in recognition of her dec decades of dedication and commitment to improving access to comprehensive Medicare, health equity, and quality health care through her legal expertise, advocacy, and compassion. Congratulations, Weiwei. Thank you, Judy. I thank you with my whole heart. I'm just incredibly moved by your and Ben's and Lucille's kind words, and I wish I could give you all the biggest hug. Um, it means so much to me to receive this special honor given in remembrance of Chip and in tribute to how deeply he cared about advocacy. I first met Chip more than 20 years ago when I attended a Medicare and nursing home law training for advocates that he gave in Richmond, Virginia. On the drive there, my colleague asked if I had ever been to one of Chip's trainings before. Um, I told her I hadn't and she smiled and said I should observe Chip and the audience closely and prepare to be amazed. Um, she couldn't explain what she meant, but I soon understood uh, because from the moment Chip stood up to speak in his eloquent and thoughtful manner, you could just feel this warm, invigorating, and almost palpable connection between every person there. And for the rest of the day, a powerful sense of community embraced the room. I think this synergy flowed from Chip's immense gratitude for this caring and dedicated group of advocates um, and how blessed he felt to be there in fellowship with them. Um, they described to him the difficulties that their older adult and disabled clients encountered in navigating the healthcare system. And Chip analyzed with them, you know, what might be happening to be 
uh, to prevent them from obtaining the medical care that they needed. These advocates trusted that CHIP would take their clients' problems to heart and bring them to the attention of those who needed to know about them, because that's what CHIP always did. Um, in his writings, outreach, and testimonies, he stated plainly how people were being harmed, um, and he carefully examined the causative factors, and he laid out clearly and directly what the law required and what else needed to be done to ensure their rights and protect their health. So as a beginner who was just starting out back then, I gained a sense that day of what lay ahead for me in this work. And I also gleaned some important lessons about being a good advocate just from watching Chip. Well, fast forward to the present, and it's still the case that I am a beginner with a lot to learn. Um, luckily, I have cleverly learned to seek out the knowledge, expertise, and assistance of many others to guide me in better helping beneficiaries through direct service and systemic advocacy. Um, Chip likely would have approved of this because he knew that it takes a whole community to uh, make advocacy and positive, uh, positive change happen. My immediate community is the brilliant, indefatigable staff at the Center for Medicare Advocacy. I rely on every one of them for support. And I love to brag that the folks I work with are um, the salt of the earth, but they're the sugar as well. Um, you know, if there's a, a smile on my face, it's because my coworkers cheer me up. Um, for as you know, you know, the stories we hear about from beneficiaries are often difficult and even heartbreaking. More and more, our office gets crisis calls about very sick or fragile patients who are being denied crucial services, items, or medications that they can't afford. Um, at the moment when they are struggling to brave serious medical challenges, they and their loved ones are also having to fight to the point of sheer exhaustion to obtain care and coverage. This is an absolute tragedy and unacceptable. Um, a, a fundamental purpose of the Medicare program was to stop this kind of tragedy. But, you know, as you've heard today, we've been seeing shifts in the healthcare landscape that are already increasing access problems and disparities and significantly diminishing quality of care. I'm really grateful for the center's tireless efforts to address these concerning trends and to defend the promise of Medicare and to protect and improve this vital institution for current and future beneficiaries. So in closing, I just wish to thank the center's supporters, allies, and partners in this and other important work. You are our extended community, and um, I have cherished the privilege of personally getting to know and collaborate with many of you over the years. Just as it did for CHIP, um, it fills me with joy, hope, and inspiration to think of all the advocates and healthcare champions across the states who are making a difference through direct service, coalition building, policy and research, philanthropy, as well as courageous reporting to address what is happening to healthcare for the people of our country. It strikes me that you know individual lives are so often overlooked and overshadowed by the bigger picture of politics and economics, budgets and policy priorities. But for us advocates, every human being is the big picture. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Judy, again. Thank you, Wei. Every human being among who you are a star. And now another group of human beings are gonna join us and shining their light and great pleasure in thanking you for what you do. We have in particular Matt, Kata, Cortez, David Lipschitz, Kathy Holt, Ali Thayers from the Center for Medicare Advocacy. There's only so many squares we were able to be mm -hmm. assigned, but they're representing your all your colleagues. And we also are blessed with the wonderful, talk about a wonderful advocate, 
Dr. Larry Coffey, who's been um, just leading the four with you, Weiwei, to make Medicare stronger by including oral health care. And I believe that Larry has a few words to represent the rest of us. Larry? Judy, thanks. Thanks so much for the privilege. Um, Weiwei is a masterpiece. Let me repeat that. Weiwei is a masterpiece. I don't know where she hides her wings, but I'm certain she is simply an angel disguised as a mere mortal. Her demeanor is always so gracious and, and so polite, but her resolve and her advocacy on behalf of Medicare beneficiaries is absolute and it's steadfast. She is delicately strong with core humanitarian values that are so pure and immaculate and authentic. And her impeccable character is fused with a sensitive intellect. Her capacity for compassion, for empathy, and for action are seemingly without limits. She has touched and improved the lives of multitudes and those who are privileged to know her, those who are privileged to know her are truly, deeply, and richly blessed. Please know, cherished friend, of our profound respect, admiration, gratitude, and affection. Blessings to you and to everyone you cherish. You are deeply loved. Congratulations. Thank you, Larry. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Wei. Kathy, did you want to say a few words? Yes, indeed. Wei Wei, your colleagues at the Center for Medicare Advocacy celebrate the inspiration you are to us. You are a guiding light in our work as you eliminate truth and justice delivered with compassion and dignity for each person who seeks our help to access covered Medicare and health care. We know that CHIP's spirit is celebrating with us. Congratulations to you, our dear friend. Thank you, Kathy. And last but certainly not least, Allie. Thank you. When I need to hash something out or think something through or generally improve uh, my writing on any topic, I turn to Weiwei. After talking to Wei, I come away with better ideas, better writing, and a better understanding of whatever issue I'm working on. Wei also never ceases to, um, uh, to inspire me with her compassion and dedication to our clients, a quality of chips that resonates very strongly in Wei Wei. She also has a very important quality for the litigation work that we do at the center, namely a good sense of humor, which has helped sustain me through the twists and turns of our cases. Thank you, Wei, and congratulations. Indeed, we would not Judy. be able to live our life and do our work were it not for humor. And uh, that smile that Wei Wei just brought to us. And I'm wondering if the audience can see this smile of chips and um, congratulations, Wei Wei. Judy, I hope I you can just... see how much we, we love you all. I David? love you guys. <laughs> David? I could just throw in one, one last comment. Wei, you, you just said that you look to chip for lessons of being a good advocate. I and a whole lot of other people look to you for the very same lessons. And I might be the first to wear this bracelet, but I hope I'm not the last to bring about a guiding question that we should all ask ourselves. And I ask myself when doing advocacy, what would Wei Wei do? That <laughs> is my guiding principle from here on out. Thank you. A Wei. lot of W's there. <laughs> it is. <clears throat> Anyone else? You wonderful people, the wonderful Center for Medicare Advocacy. Wei Wei, thank you so much. Now we'll move to our closing remarks, and um, I want to thank 
everyone so much for staying the course with us today. I hope you found it as inspiring and important today as possible because that's what we wanted for you. And now I'm, I'm happy to say, um, before I say too much more, that we're honored to have Naomi Stanhouse from RRF Foundation, our program officer, who with, graces us with the general operating grant, would like to say a few words. Naomi? Thank you. What a thought-provoking and inspiring summit. Um, and thank you for giving me just an opportunity to say a couple of words. Um, We've been a staunch supporter of the Center for Medicare Advocacy for more than a decade. And during that time, we've come to appreciate how important it, it is to provide steady support for lead advocacy organizations that are essential to protect, preserve, and enhance Medicare. We've seen how long-term gains like winning the right to appeal observation status or to win the Jimmo case and now to ensure its implementation, these don't come from short-term efforts. We know that achieving affordable health care and health equity for economic justice does not come easily and it takes long-term support. It's taken RRF Foundation for Aging too long and after too many burdensome one-year proposals from the center that they had to submit for us to recognize that multi-year general operating support was a far better approach all around. So for any funder listening today or listening to the recordings that I hope will follow this summit, we encourage you to provide this type of core support. And a shout out to our colleagues at the John A. Hartford Foundation for providing this type of core support as well in recent years. As Judy, you've aptly said to me so many times, this unrestricted funding allows the center to pivot, persist, and persevere. For the advocates with us, I hope you continue to gather and strategically use those compelling stories, those case examples, um, that demonstrate the systemic reforms you are seeking and that you make that case to funders like us for the strong return on investment that you that they will get if they support advocacy. So thank you to all of you for working so hard to preserve, protect, and improve Medicare and to the Center for Medicare Advocacy for your incredible leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. What an honor to have your support, the foundation support. Thank you, thank you. And Jeff, would you like to please say a few words, then I'll close us out. I know you would like to give thanks to many, including our other our sponsors for this particular event. Absolutely. Thank you, Judy. And first off, congrats to my dear colleague, Weiwei, an absolute champion of advocacy. Um, thank you all. Uh, to our attendees today for joining us and for being part of the Center for Medicare Advocacy's community. Um, I'm happy to report that we have over 600 uh, registrants today from all 50 states, including uh, also Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Guam, and American Samoa. So it's truly been a, a national uh, event for us. Um, Speaking of our community, many of you have been working on these issues together for years, decades even, and as a, a relatively new member to this community, I've, I've witnessed your dedication to make a difference in the lives of families across the country, and I'm, I'm inspired by you, your passionate, passion to do good, to make a way where there is no way. To all of our presenters today, as we plan this event together, it's been moving to see how you inspire each other, you learn from each other, and you forge partnerships together for a better tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, in addition, absolutely, none of this would be possible without our, our stellar sponsoring organizations. Our inclusivity sponsor, Arnold Ventures, the Senator Jay Rockefeller Lecture Sponsor, the John A. Hartford Foundation, our panel sponsors, AARP, the Alzheimer's Association, Santa Fe Group, and SEIU. Our community sponsors, the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation and Powers Law. Our program sponsors, the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care, Medicare Rights Center, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and the Rothkoth Law Group. And our friends of the summit. Families USA, the Ger Gerontological Society of America, Justice and Aging, Sturgill and Long, and the Lynch Group of Oppenheimer and Company. 
and the Mansfield family practice. Thank you all for your gracious support of the National Voices of Medicare Summit and Senator Jay Rockefeller lecture. Um, and before I go, I also want to highlight that on the summit attendee webpage that we sent to everyone attending today, you will find supplemental materials, including an exclusive sneak peek of an extraordinary report titled Telehealth and the Medicare Population, Building a Foundation for the Virtual Health Revolution by my brilliant colleague, Cinnamon St. John. You have this tremendously important report in your materials. Thank you, Matt. Jeff. Thank you, Judy. Well, I just want to close out by this little bit of a love fest between our colleagues um, within the center, within our foundation friends who make it possible, and our sponsors, our clients who inspire us every day. And Mr. E.J. Dion, who said, when made me think, when I'm up, I'll help those who are down. And when I'm down, and I will be, they will be there for me. We will make sure that we are there for those who cannot be heard otherwise. We will continue, yes, Naomi, to plan and then pivot and persevere to make sure that the Medicare program do make sure we do everything we can to make sure that the Medicare program meets its promise to open doors to quality, equitable health care for all those who rely on it to access health care. Thank you all so very much for what you do, for joining us at the summit. And we hope next year we will also be able to now share some chat in person with those of you who can make it and have a hybrid combination conversation as well for those who will join us remotely. It's been a wonderful day to be with you all. Thank you so very much.